Welcome to Aberdeen on behalf of Charles and the team. I don't know whether Jeff wants to say a few words, but those of you who will have been here for the first time will know now why Jim is very keen to be a, an SFAC chair. Because if you look outside, you'll see all the photographs of the great and the good who ever held that, chip, that uh, role before. And Charles is similarly, I know, keen that he should be remembered for posterity. Why, Charles? And uh, I think his, his photograph will be slightly larger than anybody else's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, today's gathering, I don't know if you want to say a few words before I just do an introduction. Yeah. Okay. I mean, basically, I just want to say that, I mean, it's a useful, be a very useful exercise, I hope, and a good use of everybody's time. It says briefing session up there. As far as I'm concerned, this is a discussion stroke briefing session. Yeah. And I don't want the fact that it's recorded to be the cause of anybody being less than frank. My preference would be to have a written note, and I intend to be frank as and when I want to be, and I'm not going to be constrained by the fact we're recording. I think it's absolutely crucial at this stage in the process, given the amount of time we've spent on this, and the amount of time we might be spending on it in future, we have a good discussion following the briefing, and the two things gel together. I think it's absolutely vitally important. I've just seen the pack of papers there and uh, I don't know how far they go back but my start of this is December 2010. That's my starting point. The conference with the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health held in London. That's when this started as far as I'm concerned uh, and, that, and I will refer to that during the course of the day subject to what uh, contributions um, I wish to uh, make, which will be um, infrequent, I promise you that. But I do think this is important, uh, given the time we're going to spend on this, and the time we've already spent on it, by the way, which is an important part of um, FSA's uh, remit. Uh, and the situation now out, out there isn't as it was when we started on the exercise, anyway, in terms of uh, local government. But uh, I welcome apologies for the fact that we've got three board members missing as part of the consequences of bringing people on the board in a, a group where their diary commitments, because they were delayed on getting on, their diary commitments are such they, they can't all make it, but um, uh, they're all very interested, believe you me. I'll leave it there, uh, Tim, but uh, we've had... Oh, oh, hello, uh, Sarah. Good morning. Mike, Mike, have you... That's it. Sorry, is that better? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, yes, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Uh, so say, it seems funny for me, for me to be in London and you in Aberdeen. <laughs> it's, uh, it's sod's law, but we really appreciate the fact that, although you're in London and other issues, the fact that you're prepared you know, to contribute to this, so it's really, really helpful. And thanks, uh, thanks very much indeed. Good. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to be brief. Um, when I'm standing here normally, as Charles will know, I'm speaking to the assembled masses of the... Scottish FSA staff and normally Charles has just given a talk about how people should use the car park and not to run in the corridors when they're carrying hot coffee so no church notices this morning. Um, what we're going to talk about today strikes I think at the heart of our consumer protection role and grateful to Jeff for kind of kicking off with the timing because we are going to be talking about exactly the same time scale since that CIEH gathering when people made pledges and commitments um, back in the autumn of 2010. Um, it's a really big, important strategic program of work for us. And by definition, this element, what um, the team we're going to talk about, is not tactical or is driven by any specific crisis. And I will come back to that because if those events do change, if events change our approach to this, then that is something that I think we need to be smart enough to deal with. This was, for those of you who weren't around at the time, colloquially known at, the, at that moment as Tim's big idea. So I have got skin in the game when it comes to this, um, but it hasn't been known as that since the professionals here and Catherine at the back uh, got hold of it and did the proper civil service job on it. Um, but the big idea, and I'll talk about how we, this might have happened if we'd done it commercially rather than in the way that proper civil servants do it, might have been different. Uh, the idea, I think, was balanced off by interventions from particularly John when we talked about it in our 
meeting in uh, Ferrer in October, I think it was, 2010, suggesting that rather than try and go straight to the heart of the solution, we should look at how we might also contemplate at least fixing the existing system. And all of those principles and values are going to be covered today. It was actually introduced in the autumn of 2010 as the only serious significant revision of the strategic plan. So all credit to Jeff who arrived in the summer of that year. It could have easily turned into um, you know, a whole revision of the strategic plan. And those of you who see the strategic plan over there in the corner will note that materially it changed because of machinery government change, but the substance stayed the same apart from this, this check on the enforcement regime. Since then, of course, we have seen, and Gail and the team will cover this in more detail, real concerns about the sustainability of the current regime. That, those concerns existed then, but they've been magnified since. And just to kind of my little checklist for my own benefit, the CSR 10 impact, where lots of training standards folk, lots of highly trained, commendable activity by them on training standards has slowed or stopped. And similarly, we've seen a slightly slower but uh, significant reduction in the amount of CIH members and REHIS members up, it, up here in Scotland doing frontline work, and its patch it varies by, by locality. The next um, spending round is looming, and we know that because the local authorities are starting to plan forward almost to 2020 and beyond, and that concerns us because obviously they're getting used to this trajectory which is ever downwards in terms of their costs. Jeff reminds me from time to time, and he's right to, that we used to have quite a good coordinating body. LACORS did a reasonable but not perfect job of coordinating between the national regulators, HSE, ourselves, Environment Agency and others, um, between the frontline professionals, people who actually deliver all these responsibilities on the ground, and the national regulators. And that role has been pretty much swept aside and replaced by a very small number of people who aren't always representative of all members because it's a membership organisation that we interact with. There is this quote now which has started to gain a bit more momentum from the chief executive of the LGA, um, which says that by 2020, projecting forward demand and supply, um, her, her assessment is that the only thing local authorities will be able to afford to do is, apparently she's modified it now, empty the bins and adult social care. And it's the adult social care that would be their first and only priority if things stayed as they were. So that kind of gives a signal to all the national regulators that we need to think about life in a, a different way for that sort of timescale. Positively, we've seen quite a few innovative local authority solutions. Jeff's made reference to those in, in various email exchanges he and I have had. We've seen it in Manchester, we've seen it in Worcestershire, we've seen it in um, some London boroughs and some, uh, some on the coast, on the south coast, where things have started to work more collaboratively. We've seen it here in Scotland. Um, but that is obviously going to vary, and giving up local territory varies by um, local... So we may end up with 434 local authorities, or we may end up with something approaching 250, but we'll still end up with at least 250 variations on a theme. We've also got, not surprisingly, and I'll give my credit to John Howard, my predecessor, what he used to call the variable geometry of devolution in that in Wales we thought something different was going to happen to what has actually happened, but there was always that distorting impact that was likely to impact on what we did. Here in Scotland, post Scudamore, post the Matheson announcement, and, and then onwards, and then that variable, devil, that variable geometry might change still further. Those are just some basic sort of things that will, will or will not impact on, on what the team are trying to do. But at the same time, we're trying to do this with a, in a sort of measured and structured way that, that they can explain better than I can. I'm often asked the question, and I think it's probably quite relevant given that I'm likely to now go back to the place that I came from, the commercial um, world, how we would have done this in, say, some of my last organisations. And I've thought about this quite a lot. It, we would definitely have done it within six months, because nothing takes lo longer than six months in the, in the outside world. It just doesn't. And the, the, the upside of that is that you would have had pace that we couldn't possibly get in the organisation that we now find ourselves. 
we would have taken a spectacular number of risks by comparison to what we can do and ought to do as a, a policy making organisation we'd have used a hell of a lot less evidence and we would have been very expensive so what the costs that are about to be sort of uh, explored with you I would probably just looking at those have doubled them for consultancy activity and so on because I probably wouldn't have had the resource to do this sort of thing we'd have failed the FSA's principles test full stop I mean we just would why because this would have been if this had been Tim's big idea in the commercial world it would have been the only one that survived so with respect to John my sort of four nation body would have had it by now we'd have been doing it and it might have failed and it might have failed for a very good reason that it wasn't really good enough it really wasn't up to standard but we could have closed the door on that and moved on to another chapter and that there is a huge distinction between the way that things get done in, that, in my old world and, and, and in this world here but I think it's worth referencing that and that's what will be running across the minds of people like Jeff and Clive I think particularly whether or not the pace is appropriate to the actual the policy making that's going on and uh, there are enough people around the table from um, all parts of the agency to kind of explain that better but I think the critical thing is we would have definitely failed to convince the uh, the key stakeholders, the people on the front line and their current employers that whatever we were doing was actually going to give a better solution for consumers and if that market failure which we've now seen in animal feed Andrew if that market failure then extended into this world because of all those factors then frankly what we're doing with Catherine and Gail and the team would have to be set to one side whilst we fix that problem I think that's that's self-evident the fact that we can do it for animal feed doesn't mean we could do it for the rest of the official controls regime but if local authorities start to fall over we will have to fix that problem we, it won't be good, good enough to say well we're in the middle of a review we'll see you in 18 months time it just won't happen like that will it it won't be possible so our, our going in position is this is a strategic activity but one that might turn tactical if things go severely pear-shaped on the financial front or if local authorities do start to walk away in the way they have on, on, um, on animal feed the biggest impact of the, uh, the work is definitely aimed at improving public health protection and I've gone back to my slides Jeff that I used for the introduction to this when it was still called Tim's big idea and there are still questions in, the, in those slides that we don't yet have an answer to you know, of the one million people that we can extrapolate get sick from uh, eating food in this country food foodborne illness how many of them will not get sick as a consequence to us changing this regime and that makes us all twitch because I think unless you can answer that question all of this becomes more difficult and every one of those has got an economic benefit I'm going to shut up we've assembled as you know for each of these major projects we assemble a very strong team with I think what are complementary skills you haven't met them before in this context or probably in any other um, and we need them to be robust with us um, with us as the exact impartial and evidence-based but most importantly their recommendations through us and through you need to be credible to all the key stakeholders that are going to watch very carefully what we do my final thought is this we're going to break today into three sections and as Jeff said the critical bit is the discussion so there is a presentation which I haven't actually seen um, but that will sponsor that will provoke that will catalyze a discussion between the people who are here today and then onwards and the packs that you've got in front of you are, are to keep pace with what's happening on the screen behind me and to make some notes as, as you wish but also I think Jeff hopefully they've got everything in it that we've ever said or done since that fateful day at CIH uh, gathering in, uh, in London followed by our meeting at Ferrer in York so that board members who need to as we start to get towards making policy decisions which of course we won't be doing today um, as we start to get policy making decisions this should be the Bible and anything that follows it can be added to it thank you and um, for those of you who don't know this is Gail and Neil who is Catherine's right hand person where's Catherine hiding at the back um, we have got, we've got a kind of uh, slightly 
An emergency ward 10 failed to today, and Alison, Alison is just back, and the reason she's leaning off to one side like that is um, probably self-evident. Uh, Catherine is going to help Philip keep score at the back and make sure he writes all the right things down, but thank you for coming, Catherine, because I'm particularly grateful. I know you're not entirely recovered yet, and similarly, Alison. Um, but working on this project is not a sort of precursor to ill health, is it? <laughs> yeah. Immediately coming back from Australia for two weeks, so perhaps it is. Um, thanks very much, Tim. Um, as Tim said, um, Catherine, as our program manager, obviously is here today, but the rest of the team will actually be taking you through the briefing session and present for the discussion that happens this morning. And that's myself, and um, as well as sort of looking after things while Catherine's been away, I'm actually the evidence program manager for the review. Um, and in, in addition to myself, there'll be John Cragg, who uh, is leading on our evaluation and appraisal work, Kerry Cooper, who's the lead analyst for the team, and Louise Knowles, who's leading on our stakeholder engagement work. And they'll be um, sort of talking to you at various points throughout the morning um, to cover off particular sections of what we want to cover with you today. Now, I have to now figure out how the technology works. Right, okay. So the way that we've planned the session with you this morning is we've got sort of five bite-sized chunks to go through with you. Um, and at the end of each of those sections, we'll stop for a few minutes to allow questions or comments or for any discussion on the individual sections that you want to cover. Um, we've obviously got quite a long session with you this morning, so we thought it might perhaps be a good uh, plan to have a bit of a comfort break somewhere in the middle to allow people to get water and, and, and other things. Um, and then at the end of that process, um, we've left plenty of time, I hope, for a general discussion around the direction of the program and things like that. What we've planned out today covers um, sort of uh, sort of has a twofold purpose, if you like. We're aiming, of course, to bring new board members up to speed with the program of work, because obviously you haven't had the chance to really hear about the work before and haven't been involved in the development of it. And so particularly for your benefit, we've got a lot of information in the pack, I hope, that gives good background to the, to the review. But also, we'll do a quick trot through a couple of introductory sections, um, looking at what is the landscape that we're actually looking at reviewing, and how has the actual program itself developed. And then we'll go into detail with you on how we're actually undertaking the assessment of the current system, option development, and appraisal, and what the evidence needs are that are required to support that process and make it robust and rigorous and so then and Kerry will take you through that um, part of the, the talk. I'll then cover how we're actually filling the evidence gaps, how we've structured that, how long it takes um, and what we need to do and then Louise will finish off with a short section on stakeholder engagement because this is really something that's absolutely crucial to the review and runs all the way through it and underpins all of the other work that we're doing. So, as I said, part of this is an introduction to the program for new board members. The other thing that we want to cover today throughout the various sections are some of the issues that you raised with us in the March board meeting about the depth of evidence needed and the timing of the program. So those are the issues that we hope to cover and explore with you today. So at this point, with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to John, who's going to give you um, a quick overview of what the landscape looks like. So, John. Thanks, Gail. Morning everyone, uh, my name is John Cragg, I'm an environmental health officer by training and qualification uh, and currently um, managing uh, Andrew's operations group, the hygiene delivery branch which supports um, local authority official control but for the moment on full time secondment to the team um, and I've managed local authority um, food safety delivery teams in small authority and a larger unitary authority in the past so I bring the on the ground uh, delivery of official controls um, if you like expertise to the team. And just a quick overview of the very high level structure that we're talking about. Uh, and sitting at the top of that, of course, is, is the EU. Um, the EU imposes its requirements on member states through uh, competent authorities. The FSA is the competent authority for the UK as far as food safety goes. And the EU does that largely through directly applicable regulations which impact on the central competent authority competent authorities that are delegated below that and of course food businesses as well. They apply directly in, in our country. Um, there are various models throughout the EU but in this country we've built on the existing local authority delivery model and we delegated competence to local authorities and made them competent authorities. In turn we exert our influence on them through really three main areas. Domestic regulations which um, 
create offences against the EU regulations. They create powers of entry and uh, notices that officers can serve. And they also delegate uh, competent authorities as food authorities so that they can enforce the regulations. A framework agreement you may or may not have heard of, but that's an agreement between the FSA and local authorities. And it uh, really describes a mix of enforcement activities that go ahead. The, in broad terms, the standard that's required um, and the reporting requirements to the FSA. In there are things like a uh, requirement to produce a, each local authority to produce a food service plan each year uh, and to produce enforcement policies. And last but not least, codes of practice made under uh, ministerial approval. Uh, there's a code of practice for each of the, the um, uh, devolved countries, but largely they have the same uh, content and really they set out the, um, if you like, procedures for delivering official controls. They, uh, competent authorities must have regard to this. It's a, a statutory code of practice. Uh, I've just put a nominal you know, nine spots down there for competent authorities, but the real scale of it is um, that there are 434 of these as at the last report to board uh, from the, the uh, local authority reporting data, LEMS data for 2010-11. Um, and to give, a, again, a devolved feel for that, there are 22 um, local authorities in Wales, 26 Northern Ireland, 32 Scotland, and the other 350-ish uh, uh, are, are in England. Uh, and across the authorities, uh, there are unitary authorities uh, delivering all services, or two-tier authorities with local councils, um, delivering local services with county council abo above and where you find that you usually find that food safety is delivered at the local level food standards at, at the second tier level cost of all this uh, around 200 million pounds per year uh, to, to deliver food, food safety in the UK um, we need to bear in mind that local authorities are fairly autonomous they've got control of their own budgets uh, their own resource and they decide when, when they will prosecute and take uh, action and what type of action they will take as well. What does the work look like that they do? Well, the bulk of the work, as you might suspect, is around restaurants, caterers, retailers. Um, and uh, it gets fewer to the right. But this area, particularly the um, manufacturers and packers, is a difficult area for local authorities. Some real technical issues in there, particularly with approval of plants that deal with product of animal origin. Who delivers within this structure? Um, nominally, there are, are 2,900 2, around posts uh, out there, but when this was uh, reported, 2,774 officers in place actually delivering, and they are environmental health officers and food standards officers, uh, sorry, food safety officers supporting them, trading standards and, and port health teams. Examples of their outputs to give you a feel and a scale of things. Um, a massive amount of interventions take place, well over half a million. Uh, and by interventions, we mean inspections, follow-up visits to check whether uh, verification, whether um, improvement activity is taking place, sampling, advice to business, surveillance, that sort of thing. And of those interventions, um, 320,000 are actually on-site inspections, so a very labour-intensive uh, delivery um, scenario. FSA, of course, needs to support this, and uh, it's done through Andrew's operations group, which was formed when... Uh, meat hygiene service was de-agencified a couple of years ago now and merged with the existing structure that we had in place to support local authority operations. Sorts of things that go on there in this interface, very important guidance and technical support, for instance, maintaining the code of practice, updating it, uh, speaking to local authorities about that. Issuing guidance, some really important guidance recently went out on um, E. coli uh, and what officers should be looking for in businesses, particularly um, particularly butchers with regard to E. coli um, controls. Audit and regional presence. Audit can take place. Uh, audit of local authorities can be actually um, a local authority specific activity or a cross cutting themed approach, for instance, uh, application of HACCP principles by businesses or really application of the E. coli guidance that was issued. That's been a recent audit. Regional presence. Uh, this is in England. Uh, and different arrangements throughout the uh, devolved FSAs. But regional presence unit links with the local authorities through their food liaison groups, which is a collection of maybe uh, nine to a dozen local authorities that um, work together in, a, in, in an area. Uh, and the regional presence activity is disseminating agency 
um, information and gathering intelligence to feed back to us. Grant support has always been an important feature. Uh, we tend to issue this where there's a, a broad need um, and a good instance of that would be the food energy rating scheme where we've wanted people to convert to that. The UK food sampling rate, um, database where we wanted people to um, link their own systems to a national database of food sampling so that we, we contribute to their cost of transfer. And very top of the at the moment, um, we're supporting uh, Olympic authorities in there dealing with the uh, Olympic um, um, sort of peak in activity that we experience from food businesses. And last but not least, the agency has a very strong tradition of providing low cost training for officers to gain consistency. Uh, this is really around um, the areas that are in depth technically. Um, has a part at my offices is one area. Um, and then products of animal origin areas, for instance, um, approval of sort of shellfish deprivation plants or pasteurization activities on farm, very technical areas where um, a few officers need training in depth. The arrangements do differ, that's, that's largely an England model, they do differ uh, across the devolved regions, but the things that are delivered are the same. This really, the bit I've just talked about is business as usual. It goes on every day, day in, day out in Andrew's group. Um, and to draw the distinction between that and um, the work that the review team is doing, um, this will change uh, depending on policy, legislation change uh, in the short term. What we're about in the review is looking at the, for want of better words, the model, the framework that exists in a more permanent manner. Um, and to make sure it's fit for future in terms of um, effectiveness, um, efficiency, resilience, and that it will protect consumers going forward. So that's the difference between the two. We're looking more at the structure of it and not the daily um, what's happening from day to day. Okay. Um, Gail just wants to say some words about program development now, I think. Yes, All right. that's right. Does anybody have any questions for John, though, about any <coughs> points of detail, particularly perhaps from new board members who might not be quite so familiar with the structure? Uh, yes, you do. You need to turn your microphone on because we're being recorded. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yes, uh, you mentioned that the, the cost of delivery was £200 million, I think. Is that right? Is there a forecast of what that's going to be in 2015 and, and 2020? We might hand over to Kerry at this point as our analyst who does all those forecasting type things. Covering part of that, it's something we're working on at the moment um, and something also that the evidence programme within the review is, is uh, focused around tackling. At the moment we're having to estimate those numbers because the financial data that gets collected by central government from local authorities is um, quite patchy at, at the level of detail for food safety. So that's um, an estimate that we've extrapolated from the information that is there and the projects within Gale's evidence gathering program are really trying to tie that number down so that we're more confident in what's being spent at the moment and much better able to project forwards what that will look like in 2015. Do you have a kind of working estimate of what it's like? Um, <laughs> well, um, OBR estimates that the total local authority um, spend, so that's across everything, will go down um, by 14% over that time frame and I think John covers a lot of these yeah. figures in his slides um, so I don't want to steal too much of his thunder um, and then um, as Tim already said LGA have taken that forward and projected again what they think um, the impact on overall funding of local authorities is up to 2020 is it Tim and that's um, a 23% is that right 23% reduction um, from the staff of this current parliament Okay. Um, but obviously food safety is a very small amount um, within that whole yes. spending package so it really is quite tricky to, yeah, to estimate down what's going to happen. It's part of the problem that we have and it's one of the activities we'll talk to you about when we're talking about the evidence gathering program is about how we're trying to capture information from local authorities in terms of what they believe is going to happen to their food safety budgets going forward so that will allow us to refine those kind of estimates. Are there any other questions before we I move on? In other words, have you got information? Have you got information now then you're going to present to us about the savings that local authorities are taking out of the system now as we're doing the review? But in other words, we know they're estimating this 14%, but they're actually taking savings out themselves 
because of merging, joint working and all that kind of thing. Have you got figures at, on that basis? At the moment we don't, Jeff, because we don't have any way of accessing that information. But can you hold that thought because we mm. will come back to that very much when we're talking about the um, assessment of the current system and what information we actually need to do that. Because that's the whole point of our evidence gathering. We don't know this information and we don't have an easy way to get it. So what we've had to do is design a way of tackling those issues. So we will come back to that a bit later in the presentation. Any other questions? No? I noticed that Clive has now joined us in London. So hello and welcome, Clive. And um, apologies that we're going to be, um, you're probably going to see at the most the back of our heads. Um, so apologies for that. But um, thank you very much for joining us. Sorry. Right, okay, so what we'd like to talk to you about now is the development of the program. And again, this is a bit of a primer for uh, new board members and a quick recap of how we got to the program that we have actually came and talked to you about at the March board meeting, highlighting and touching on some of the um, changes um, to, the, to the program as it's gone along its life. And what we'll be covering with you briefly this morning um, is why have we actually decided that it's important for us to do this review of this complicated landscape and this de delivery system that we have at the moment? So what's the rationale behind doing the work? What was actually decided in terms of what work needed to be done and how it should be approached um, at the January Open Board meeting in 2011? The initial um, program, high-level program plan that you saw during um, the, your discussions at the July 2011 Open Board meeting um, and then the changes that came between that discussion that you had in July and the progress update that we came to you with in the March 2012 board meeting. So what was the sort of primary rationale behind actually doing this um, sort of large complex strategic piece of work and does that rationale actually hold true? Has it continued to remain a concern to us that drives us to do this program of work? I guess there are two key reasons as I see them um, and as we discuss in the team quite frequently about why we need to do this piece of work. And they fall really primarily from, from my perspective, I suppose, as a person with a strong public health background um, into the <coughs> first category, which is concern about consumer protection. Is the system that we have at the moment with delegated delivery via local authorities sustainable in the long term? And can we be assured that the quality of those controls, the delivery of those controls, is going to be maintained and that it has the level of consistency, both of application and of outcome, that we believe is necessary necessary for consumer protection. So over the couple of years leading up to 2010, we had lots of information starting to um, actually emerge out of our analysis of the LEAMS uh, data, and that was particularly taken forward by Kerry's colleagues in ARD. They gave us concerns around um, some of the variability and inconsistency that we saw in the delivery of those controls. The difficulty we had with that information is we actually have very little way of um, matching up whether that variability has a massive uh, impact on the outcomes of the application of those controls. So we don't know how effective they are. We've also, um, of course, during 2010, saw or we're concerned around the impacts of the comprehensive spending review, as Tim has said, and as we've just mentioned with some figures there about the scale <coughs> of funding cuts that we're looking at. Now, we, as an organisation, had to look at making our own cuts and we realised how significant that could be for us as an organisation, trying to meet those very challenging spending targets. And of course we recognised that the scale of cuts directly being applied to local authorities in England were really very, very large and we had real concerns about what they were going to have to cut in order to be able to actually meet those spending um, cut targets. That's for England, but obviously those, that <coughs> comprehensive spending review settlement had a similar or potentially similar impact in the devolved administrations as well on local authorities there indirectly because, of course, the settlement to the devolved administrations, to the devolved governments, was cut um, and therefore they were going to have to find a way of actually making those cuts and they were potentially going to be passed on to local authorities in the devolved administrations. Less clear in terms of what the scale of cuts that local authorities in the other UK countries apart from England might be facing, but nonetheless enough to give us real cause for concern that the system might not be sustainable or that we couldn't maintain the quality of the system that we'd want to be seeing to be delivered for consumer protection. 
At the same time, over the past couple of years, as John alluded to, um, we've de-agencyified, if that is actually a real word, um, the MHS and brought that in-house, essentially, created a new group, our operations group. And we learnt a lot of lessons through that process and a lot of positive outcomes have come from it. One of which is the recognition that that, that gives us a really direct way of actually performance managing the delivery of official controls so that we can be confident that we've got the information we need to take action if things aren't working well. We can understand where the strengths and weaknesses are very um, easily so we can quickly react to that. So those to me were the sort of two key factors that came together during 2010 that provided the rationale um, for coming to the board with a paper in January 2011 to discuss going forward with undertaking a review. The question is, does that rationale still hold true? Have we seen these massive cuts in local authorities really impacting on services? How much of a handle do we actually have on what's happening out there? What do we know about the impact this is having? And so what I'd like to do now is just hand back to John briefly to sort of really give you a bit of an update on those key drivers and what information has emerged over the last sort of 18 months since the program was instigated. So John, I will hand back to you. Thanks, Gail. Yeah, the couple of key drivers we want to look at are threat to local authority resourcing and, as we see, the variability and quality of official controls and the evidence that points to uh, a problem there. Now, we're not trying to demonstrate here that the current system is about to keel over, curl up and die, or that it suffer catastrophic failure, but we are saying that there is a cause for concern that needs addressing, and it needs addressing through an organised review. The slides, and we're just going to go through a few slides that provide a flavour in your pack with more detail on these two issues. Firstly, to look at the, um, the resource area across the four countries, and it's resource in terms of finance and officer resource, but bear in mind that finance largely is not ring fence for local authority food safety delivery. It's part of a, a general uh, uh, provision of finance to the local authority. They use it as they see fit uh, according to their elected members. In England, uh, government funded to councils, net decrease of 14%. That was a headline figure of 27%, um, but when you take other income into account, it nets down to 14% by 2015. Uh, and to pick, on, on Tim, pick up on Tim's comments, um, LGA anticipate that reduction in total by 2920 will be 23%. If that occurs, they'll retreat to their um, essential services delivery, which is basically empty in bins and social care. That's what they're saying. Northern Ireland, a much better picture. It's been stable over the last few years. Fairly high profile um, food safety delivery in Northern Ireland. But in this term, there is a, uh, an aim to reduce uh, reform, to reduce the local authorities from 26 to 11. Some funding is ring fenced in, in Northern Ireland. Scotland, um, Rehis report that the number of food safety officers fell by 11%. That's 70 odd officers over the three years to October 2011. Um, and when FSA Scotland did their annual review, which has run for three years now of local authorities, um, six, that's 19% of the local authorities in Scotland declared that they got inadequate resource to deliver the approved food service plan under the framework agreement. In Wales, central funding cut by 7.5% to Welsh Government. That will have varied effect on authorities and services within authorities. Um, and FSA one-off survey last year um, respond, response there was that um, 12 local authorities, 55% said they couldn't meet their commitments against the Food Law Code of Practice. So to summarise that threat to resource and LGA have recently, um, a couple of weeks ago, produced um, this graphic as part of an overall report which is their, their modelling, their preliminary modelling of cuts and um, and funding for councils going forward to 2020. Um, it comes with a caveat. It's LGA, they produced it, they represent local authorities. The assumptions in this paper haven't been tested by our economists yet. Um, but it does set out, you know, pictorially, the, the um, sort of um, scenario that we face. Uh, top line net expenditure, this is uh, for current services, but if they aren't cut, and the bottom line is the projected income. So to summarise against that background, funding is varied picture across the UK. Um, but a general background of cuts. We're finding that this is driving local authorities to 
innovate and, uh, and adapt to the services they deliver, sometimes in a way that we don't want them to and doesn't fit with the code of practice. In fact, we will be writing out very shortly to local authorities to re-emphasize how we see those uh, amended ways of working and if they sit well with the code of practice or not and the impacts that that, that can have on service delivery. We ran a mini summit in Scotland, um, what was it, three weeks ago, uh, where um, local authority lead food officers came along and talked about the effects of funding cuts. They saw really that this innovation is creating an elasticity in service delivery. So it looks as if everything's going on quite normally, but on, underneath that they're saying that things are getting stretched and they talked about running on a reserve tank. That's, that's the words of the, the um, food safety team leaders in Scotland. They feel they're running on a reserve tank. They also mentioned that restructuring is leading to uh, a reduced influence of food safety teams um, in that as they are uh, incorporated into larger, wider directorates or merged authorities, um, and that widens, what used to be a very clear lead for food safety moves down the pecking order to the point sometimes where the chief officer disappears and they're just a lead food officer. Um, that reduces their influence, their lever in local authorities. And I think the point which struck you, Tim, was that it actually causes loss of budgetary control as well, um, which they mentioned. So they actually lose control of the budget for food safety, which is quite a dangerous thing. Uh, and lastly, the point they made, which is very evident, Officer numbers, experience and competence base is reducing. If people are going to uh, leave due to cuts, it's usually the most experienced officers. Regarding timing, well, if you're going to carry out a review, you want to carry it out towards the end. You don't want to be in the middle of this where you might have to take precipita precipitate action to deal with authorities that are, are falling over uh, and you've got to take actions in a way perhaps that you wouldn't want to do in a more considered manner. So we're saying really the timing is right for the review. If you want an alternative uh, take on that, um, Chartered Institute of Environmental Health asked their um, members this question, is it the right time for the FSA to, do a review, to, ca to carry out a review for hygiene controls? And the response was a resounding 77% said yes. Nearly 80% of the officers that responded said they did want to review at this time. The main reason was, as we've just described, severe cuts to local authority delivery. But other reasons they gave were that the landscaping is changing so much that uh, really a fundamental review is needed to make sure that the way things are set up are capable of protecting public health. They also felt that in amongst that review that um, so there would be a finding that actually local authorities are doing quite well with, with what they've got to cope with at the moment. But another point they made was that they were concerned about inconsistency of delivery. And that was against this stretching and interpretation of delivery against the food law code of practice to achieve, as they saw, um, the targets that local authorities have got to achieve on food inspections. And that concern about um, consistency links to the second um, driver that we mentioned. That's the variability, quality of official controls. And again here, we're not trying to demonstrate total system failure. Uh, most of the local authorities are doing a great job with, with the resource they've got, but there are underlying concerns when we look at the local authority reporting data. Just a quick couple of examples that you'll find in the pack. Here's one on number of food businesses versus full-time equivalent employees. You can see in the um, uh, lowest number here against the highest number that an officer in this authority dealing with food hygiene has to do with three and a half times the number of premises as the one in the lowest number, uh, um, lowest number of uh, premises per officer. The food standards, that's even worse. It's five and a half times. Now, that's not good. Looking at another area, this is um, levels of enforcement. And enforcement here means anything from a formal notice up to prosecution. That took place in one and a half percent of food establishments in 2010-11. Uh, against a non-compliance rate of 11%. Now, we're not obviously saying that uh, enforcement should take place in every non-compliant premises. Where it does take place, you'd expect it to see it taking place in the least compliant premises. And when we plot the enforcement action against the food hygiene rating system uh, gradings, you can see that that is the case. This is the 1.5% taking place. And 
in the riskiest zero rate premises, you get most <coughs> enforcement action taking place, but only 20%. If you turn it on its, on its head, 80% almost of premises zero rated didn't have any enforcement action taken against them. So that's also a, a real concern. <coughs> this is backed up by some research which was done last year for us by Ipsos Mori on enforcement approaches. Uh, and one comment out of their report is that they see evidence of uh, some local authorities, uh, if you like, um, cycling. They're stuck in a, in, a, in a cycle of inspection and reporting, inspection reporting, but never kicking into that enforcement that will take the food business operator onto the next level of compliance. Some other research we um, conducted on the um, adequacy of current legal powers with the local authority officers and indeed offices in the, in, the, um, in the food side employed by the agency. Um, but local authority officers made some comments in workshops around their concerns about delivery through a local authority environment. And these are the um, economic development um, puts pressure on them. They're under pressure to, at times, uh, keep businesses operating. And I've spoken to officers on the phone in the agency who have been under pressure not to take appropriate action uh, because an elected member has either got an interest in a specific premises or, or a certain type of premises. Uh, sorry, that's the second point, uh, the elected member intervention. Um, recruitment, um, it may be confined to less experienced officers really on the basis of saving money uh, and that's a concern as well. And lastly, prosecutions, there could be a reluctance to pursue prosecutions because they're very time consuming and once you're pursuing a prosecution, you could have inspected 10, 15, 20 premises. So to summarize those concerns about variability and quality of fish controls, the level and distribution of officer resource varies significantly between LAs. Enforcement is all at a fairly low level. Uh, that's enforcement from notice uh, up to prosecution relative to the number of premises. But where it is applied, it should be applied in the most meaningful manner uh, and in the premises that uh, have lowest compliance. FSA engagement with um, official controls. Here, instances where the food and veterinary office have come to the UK and inspected. They tend to get out into the field. That's where they, they like to, to look at what's going on. Uh, on a couple of FBO inspections I've been involved with, um, Certainly, in two premises, the inspectors have turned to me as a representative of the Central Common Authority and said, what are you going to do about this? Uh, and that's really saying, how are you going to guarantee to me you will gain control again in these premises because the premises were not um, adequately controlled through fish controls. Another example, we transferred lots of catering butchers from local authorities um, in the last couple of years. Uh, these are butchers who are wholesalers um, and had to be approved as meat cutting plants. When agency officers visited those, uh, our veterinary managers, they found out that in 53% of those premises, they were judged very difficult to approve as uh, approved cutting plants. And lastly, as you just saw on the last slide, um, local authority officers are concerned about internal influences that affect and get in the way of their true uh, delivery of fish controls to protect public health. So I hope that's given you a feel, as I say, in more detail in the facts, but a feel about the, um, the resourcing issues and, and the variability and quality of the fish controls that prompt us to say to you that a review is necessary and in some depth to collect evidence around this. Um, this is just scratching the surface. We really need to know what's going on uh, in depth in local authority fish controls. Okay, I'm just going to sum up about the rationale now. Yeah. Oh, I think we can actually probably, okay. I think you've summed it up quite nicely, okay. John. So, does anybody have any questions for John before we, around the rationale, <coughs> around the, the data that he's shown you, um, or anything else that's in your pack, before we move on to actually talk about the program? Um, Jeff, do you want to Sorry. use your microphone? The uh, elected member interference. Given that, as far as I recall, local government law requires the chief executive of the local government to be a whistleblower on anything wrong with the finance because that was done when the poll tax came in gave them a new role that they had the right 
to blow the whistle on their... They had the duty to blow the whistle on their... Th Why can't we put a duty on the local authorities in enforcement that we have reported to us as the central competent authority any interference by an elected member in the decision to prosecute or use enforcement action. Why can't we do something as simple as that and have everything reported into us, you know, as a normal practice? Because that seems to me something that we ought to be, imposed, be able to impose on them. I would... I would, we'll hand over perhaps to Andrew and some of the other directors to comment on this, but my understanding of, of actually one of the things that we will be looking at as part of the program is making those kind of what we would see as improvements to the way the current system works. That's absolutely built into the review and part of what we're doing. But in actual fact, while we think that sounds like a very simple thing to do and something that should be entirely within our gift to do, in actual fact, we know very well that it is not a simple thing to do. It potentially places extra burdens on local authority. That requires extra resource. It requires you to go through a gateway review that is chaired by DCLG, has representatives from <coughs> LGA on it. And so, in actual fact, what sounds to us like a really simple recommendation that we could come out to you with, with you tomorrow and say, let's fix that, is in actual fact a complex process that we will have to go through a substantial um, sort of building a business case, developing a recommendations, consulting on, and then getting it past um, a variety of other government departments and interests in order to be able to implement. And this is one of the things that Louise is going to be talking to you about, about how we try and actually build um, a case that will uh, and actually build the engagement that we need across government to make sure that any recommendations, even there, if they're as simple as that, that we can get get those implemented as quickly as we possibly can to be able to ensure consumer protection. So the point you just made is very good. I mean, it was, it was bang on that Scotland Mini Summit. That point was made by local authorities. Yep. They said, we want to be able to speak to someone and tell them when that's happening. Yeah. So we have in mind, I mean, to, uh, you'll hear it later, to, to evaluate the current system and, and look at options, we've had to describe what a good system would look like. And in that is a whistleblowing mechanism where they can plug direct into us and let us know what's going on. That would be what you'd want in, and you'd just describe it in, in a true official control system that's going to be fit for purpose. The how vul how vulnerable are we if next week there's an outbreak <coughs> in a catering establishment or a restaurant or something like that and it turns out, and a serious one I'm on about, and it turns out in the inquiry that local councillors <coughs> did get involved, stopped some action, put pressure on the officers and the officer going to say well and we weren't able to tell the FSA about that I mean is that the reality as we are at the moment well no, I mean they can they can they, they know the contacts now they can of course contact us but what we need to do is facilitate that and make it clear that it's there and it's a conduit they can use and I think in any official control system going forward we want to build that and publicize it um, to make, make make very clear that the competent authorities is there and willing to listen because, you know, when you get into um, the north of England, they see London and the FSA as a fairly remote thing. Uh, we need to build up that connectivity, if you like. Uh, we've got the regional presence team, but they, they, they haven't got masses of people going around all the time. Uh, we've got to build those, those routes in for people. It's about also making people feel reassured that there are processes to protect them in place if they actually do um, bring those kind of issues to our attention. And that was really what came strongly out of the Scottish Mini Summit. Uh, when we discussed that, it was discussed on my table and yours as well, I think, John. Mm. Mm. We're, we're not, yeah, I, I wouldn't want people to get the wrong impression. We're not stopping local authorities telling us things or, or sharing their problems with us, and many do. One of the common ways a local authority will address uh, a problem with resourcing, funding, interference is they'll often request an audit from us, which we will usually oblige, because if a local authority feels that they require an independent audit from the competent authority, then we will, we will help them with that. And that happens quite a lot. And that's to help local authorities who are having problems with members and with senior officers not attributing the level of funding necessary to carry on protecting the public. It's to give it that profile. And nine times out of ten, that works really, really well with the local authority. So there are some mechanisms in place. I would agree that I don't think it's as methodical as it might need to be, given the way the circumstances are changing. I've certainly sat down with a number of local authorities where uh, we've discussed individual businesses that I've got concerns about, and I've been told that you know, it's extremely difficult to close or take action against those businesses because of local vested interests. But the Lehman's data does reveal to us 
what level of enforcement activity takes place based on the risk ratings of premises and anything that appears to be an anomaly we do then investigate and audit so we do chase down those things where it looks like there are gaps in the activity and sometimes we find that's just misreporting and other times we do find there are problems and that's when we intervene with the local authority and in addition we do have our procedures for whistleblowers to report things to us um, I'm not aware that we've had a, a local authority using that whistleblowing uh, procedure, but it is widely advertised on our website, and we do get a lot of reports through um, that feeds into our fraud work, for example. So uh, there are ways that they could do it if they needed to. Tim, did you have a question? Yes, I did, actually, because I think this rationale is the thing where start things started to go wrong in the March board a little bit. Um, the first question I'll pose is the system you describe is the one that we've had since the agency was set up. So why now? Because if it, you know, a lot of the flaws that you try to describe are, have been there for 12, uh, uh, for 12 years. I also think the, kind of perception, the perception that's gone out here, and I pick up a lot of perceptions from outside, is that we're doing this for a power grab, not, not because for consumer protection, so the communication's been lost. Uh, you know, so, you know, so, no, some, somewhere we can. I, I just yeah. and the other thing is, and we've got to be a little bit careful about arrogance. I think it comes through that because the resources are being lost from LAs. They can't work smarter and be quite good at it. Whereas we, as an FSA, over the last three or four years, have learned to work smarter and have less resource. So we can't assume less resource. You know, reduce the consumer protection. Otherwise, someone might be able to close look at the food standards agency itself. So, so I think, you know, I think we've got to be quite careful that you know we we how, how we how we explain this. And I and I think that's that's sort of this rationale got slightly lost in terms of the the March board because of that. For the Welsh Council data, for example, you might be able to look at central funding, but actually, if someone who lives in Wales, I know my council tax has doubled in the last six years. So it doesn't mean to say that's because central funding down is total funding. You understand? So 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 I, th I think either you aren't giving you either trying to construct the figures to present a case to us there, or you're not giving us all the figures. You understand? what I'm saying. Yeah, we're certainly not trying to construct, and we certainly haven't got a view as a team as to where this should go. Um, and I think Tim, Tim described that. We, we, we're taking this uh, review with an open mind. Um, the things we've provided to you are at a very high level, and, and it's a feel. And that's the reason why the review has got a huge yeah. evidence gathering element, is that we just don't know. Yeah, I, but yeah okay, but like, to go to my original question 12 years on, why don't we know? I can't answer that question. I've only been working for the FSA for six no, years no, and see, never in this capacity. I mean, I but I can tell you. I think that's a question to the outside world. I, I, from the outside I, world. Mean, I, I mean, my understanding is that I mean, things have improved in terms of our reporting recently with the introduction of LEAMS and so forth, which has been, I'm not sure how many years. That's been, been running for three years, thank you. Um, so that started to improve our understanding of where we were originally. Um, so we've come a long way, but we haven't, we, we haven't yet got a grasp on it. And obviously what this has done, is that, as Gav said, with the formation of the operations group, um, giving us that opportunity to see what could be going, and the comprehensive spending review that really gave us that impetus so we could, thought we, we could actually start this work. So to answer the issue on the consumer, on the engagement front, not consumer, sorry, in engagement with local authorities, I guarantee you that's absolutely true what you said. There was a huge amount of thinking that we are doing a land grab and we are looking to centralise. We have been working tirelessly over the last 12 months, and I will, it still will depend where, where, who you speak to, but I, I'm going out there pretty much on a weekly basis, and the teams through the re regional team in, in Andrew's group, um, those views are now absolutely turning around. I'm getting almost overwhelmingly positive feedback from local authorities welcoming the review. People are actually coming up to me, volunteering to be involved in the work. So, okay, I think that was probably true very much at the beginning, but actually through our work, that is, that is really not the case we're, we're hearing, particularly from the officers, that not so much the heads of service, but the people that really work on the ground who are concerned about the sustainability of, of, of the future, concerned about their jobs, concerned about their profession, actually want us to come in and, and actually look at what's happening, see what we can do. So, we, you know, the views have very much changed since the, the original jammed paper. And I think that that figure of almost 80% of the CIH membership who responded to that survey saying actually yeah now is the time to do a review 
suggest to you that there is a groundswell of concern out there amongst the very competent professionals and don't for a minute think that we don't think that those people aren't trying to do the very best job that they can in the circumstances. But there's a groundswell of opinion out there that supports our own sort of concerns <coughs> around the area that says now is a good time to look because you really need to be able to assure yourself that what the, cha the changes that are happening are not impacting on consumer protection. Now, I, as a scientist, completely have an open mind about this. As far as I'm concerned, you don't go into an evidence gathering activity with the predetermined answer at the end of it. That's not what we're doing. I fully, and John uh, and all of our team, hold our hands up and say, we don't know that the system is about to fall over. But as the central competent authority, we have to know whether we think that that is about to happen. We have to be able to assure ourselves either that the delivery system is working well and therefore we can just leave it alone and, and you know, interact with it in a way that allows us to keep that assurance or it's not working well, we detect where the problems are and we figure out what we as the Central Common Authority are going to do about it. I think John had his hand up first and then Etta and then Margaret. <laughs> just for what it's worth, I think the review is timely. I think it is, it's, it's a sensible thing for the reasons that you've just mentioned. Um, but I'm, I, I'm, I need some clarification because in John's presentation, there were uh, some of the slides put up which I'm sure people felt alarmed about. A uh, level of, inform, uh, of enforcement action was one in particular. But I, I, I just need you to clarify how that squares with details that were contained in the January 2011 report, which talks about, on the basis of the LEAMS data, performance improving in terms of uh, compliance, broad compliance. And that uh, data shows that 99% of authorities received a timely intervention in line with the frequency that's expected. Now, I'm, sh I'm assuming that. Uh, an intervention also was followed by the appropriate enforcement action, I'm assuming. But it, it, those figures don't seem to square with the detail that you provided up on the screen. I'm sure mm -hmm. I'm perhaps <coughs> missing something, so it would be useful to clarify that because the two sets uh, of data, uh, they gave a completely different yeah. impression of the overall position, and I think we need to be absolutely certain of sure. what that position is. And just as a, a, a totally separate issue, do you know what the overall response was from the CIEH for the figures that you gave? Yeah, it was, uh, I think, uh, 542 respondents and 93% of those were hygiene officers, so uh, that's a fairly good response. That's about 30% response rate, which is about standard for a survey, in actual fact. Yeah. Um, in fact, that's quite good going. Most surveys get 10 to 15% response rate. So yeah. that actually tells you the fact that you've got a reasonably high response rate in terms of those kind of, uh, that kind of survey, that, again, there's concern out there because people are actually making the effort to respond. To pick up your first point, I'm going to ask Perry uh, uh, <laughs> to come in in a second. But, 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 um, Terry's team uh, have done the underlying analysis of, of Lean's data, actually, you know, the granular stuff, not, not just what's reported by chief officers. So they've done some underbelly analysis of it. But you're looking at different things. You mentioned interventions. That would be all interventions. That would be um, a questionnaire to a, to a, to a low-grade fruit premises. Are they still doing the same things that they were doing? Um, all types of interventions. Uh, we'll be talking about enforcement there, which will be service of notice open to prosecution, so it's not comparing the same thing. And that comes out when you do some in-depth analysis, and a lot of time has been spent by Kerry's team doing in-depth analysis on the local authority data, um, and that's where you're invited to Kerry's Sorry, can, 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 can I... Because I do think this is important in terms of ensuring that we're very clear yeah. about what the position is, and it may well be just perceptions, and it may well be... Um, the way that uh, the data uh, was being used is being used. But it says here that in the January report, figures show a year-on-year -year improvement in the rate of highest-risk food hygiene establishments receiving timely interventions since 2004 to 2005. Yeah. I accept what you say about what interventions means, but the impression created by that statement is that rather than things getting worse they are in fact getting better. Now I fully accept that 
in the last couple of years, since 2010 in particular, we are facing a very difficult yeah. environment, financial environment, so I'm under no illusions that we may move rapidly backwards. But I want to be absolutely certain of the impression that we're creating in terms of the current state of affairs. And that sort of statement appears to conflict, at least from an impression point of view, with some of the... And, and I would say that it absolutely wonderful. does, John. And this is part of the problem that we have. It's very difficult at the moment with the evidence that we have. In fact, it's not difficult. It's impossible. With the evidence that we have from the different sources that we have in the different ways that they're collected to draw a real true picture of this. And this is what I have on the summary slide. What we actually have at the moment is simply insufficient and conflicting evidence. We have, on the one hand, indicators of concern, particularly to people like John and other people who have worked out in that system and know the system and know what the wrinkles are and, and what the difficulties and challenges in it are. And then we have data coming through that shows that actually more local authorities are being able to deliver more of their inspections to their highest risk premises um, as they are programmed to do. So what we really have is this evidence of a shifting landscape. We know there's stuff going on in terms of cuts. We know there's lots of changes going on in the way local authorities work with one another, share services, etc. We know that we've got some data suggesting that there are problems with consistency, other data suggesting, however, that a lot of things are actually going on well and are going on as they should do. What that actually means is that we have this cause for concern. We feel, and I hope as you look at more detail in, in some of the evidence that we've pulled together in the pack for you, or that you might want to come and talk to us individually, because I'm conscious of the time, and we're not going to have too much um, more time for discussion around this if we're going to actually take you through the, the rest of the program in a bit more detail, um, is that actually we don't think the system is going gonna, is gonna to fall over. That's not our issue here. Our issue is in actual fact that it's, it's, we have enough concern that we really really as an organisation need to go out and get a handle on the data that is actually out there and find out what is really happening so that we can make a decision one way or the other as to whether any change is actually necessary. I start from a position that we may well come to the end of this process and go actually the system works fine. What we actually just need to do is be a bit better at our data gathering so that we can assure ourselves of that more easily. Alternatively we might go oh my god there's a huge problem here we need to develop a good fix or we might go in actual fact the whole system is going to fail in five years and the local authorities themselves are actually telling us that, so we need to come up with a better solution, a better way of doing that. All of those options are on the table. What this first phase of the review about is about is about understanding whether we face a problem and what that problem might be because we don't have the evidence at the moment that allows us to draw those decisions. And that really is the rationale because what drives this whole thing is our job to protect consumers, that everybody in this room and across our organisation feels inherently in their bone is, is the most important thing. And that's really what we have to do. And, and to do that, we need to be able to reconcile those conflicting pieces of information that we get. I know that there is a number of other questions. I'm just really conscious of the time, and I know that you're going to want to discuss a bit more detail with us about um, the actual program of work that, that we're actually um, going to be doing. So um, do people want to sort of maybe hang on to the questions until the end, or is there anything really urgent around the rationale stuff that they'd like to cover right now? Yeah? Just build really on what Tim said, which was um, several times you've said that with the type of cutbacks of 23%, um, that the local councils are going to be doing bins and care and that's it. And I think um, that's a very subjective thing to say. And we must be careful that we're not, um, that the rationale is not being driven by these subjective assumptions, which really aren't true, because we know they'll still have to do planning and roads and, and everything else. And, and, and you, it's something that you've said at least twice so far and I, I would just wonder what your evidence is for saying something as strong as that because I haven't heard that before. Can I just pick up on that one, Margaret? I think um, the rationale really is there to say why we're doing the programme and it's not a rationale there to say that we must do a change or that we must implement something different. I think we it's understand that. I really do think we understand that yeah. what you've said sometimes, but it's just being a bit cautious about making subjective yeah. of comments like that several times as if... Yeah. Oh. No, I'll take that on board. And, um, and the, um, the LGA work is highly subjective. 
um, and our analysts are, are looking through that. Therefore, we should that. be very cautious. Um, is, Thank we are you. Cautious. Yeah. But the principles that there is a growing demand on services for, from local authorities is true. The population is increasing and it's ageing. And in those particular areas, there will be additional burdens and their budgets are getting cut. So the, the sort of ethos behind the work, but you are very right, um, the, their, their analysis has been done for a very specific purpose and is, and is quite subjective. Can I come in and just ask, I think we have to ask ourselves if we're asking the right question, because whether or not things are working at the minute is really irrelevant. What we do know is that in a number of years' time, there'll be 20% less budget to deliver. And so what really matters is how we deliver the controls at the front line with 20% less staff. So the framework doesn't really matter. That's, I suppose, around, it could look like moving the deck chairs around whilst the, the boat is going down. Um, do we need to look more carefully at what those controls are and how they can be delivered or could be delivered with 20% less staff? I mean, is there a more fundamental question that we need to ask ourselves, which is about protecting public health? That's a very good point. I think the concept, though, that the framework doesn't matter is, is in my opinion, not correct. I worked in public health for a long time. I developed systems to deliver services to protect the public. Um, and I can tell you that a good framework facilitates the efficient and effective delivery of those services. A bad framework hinders it. It sucks up resource and uses it in ways that aren't necessary. Um, and so I think I'm not for a moment disagreeing that there doesn't need to be work looking at what official controls are delivered, but to look at the framework and actually say, does that framework work? Is it the framework that gives us the most efficiency and effectiveness actually is quite crucial. And there is other work ongoing in the agency to look at what the actual controls are. And in fact, there's the review, of, for example, of Regulation 882. And we aren't doing this work in isolation. We work really closely, both with Andrew's business as usual teams, but also with all of the other strategic review pieces of work that are going on around this area. So I, I think that you make a good point, but I would disagree that we don't need to look at the framework. We very much do. And we are looking at what is done within that framework because we have to in order to be able to determine effectiveness and make judgments about that. And that will, we'll discuss that in a bit more detail if we get time um, when we um, get to it, when we reach the point um, about talking about the detail of the work. Clive, I think you had one last question, then we really must move on. Sure, I, I, I take your point, but as you, can, as you can hear, we're really fascinated by this area. I know that you want to move us on, but please don't move us on before we've, um, in a sense, covered our own concerns in this area. A slightly different perspective, perhaps, because so much is going to depend on the LA's reaction to wherever we arrive. And what struck me is that in the very good presentation so far, all the other institutions, bodies and organisations that work through BLAs may well have had or be having the same meetings as we're having in the context of how they're going to be working their own uh, coordination with LAs with 20% less in, in 2020. And I suppose I'm sitting here quite nervous of wherever we arrive, what ability there will be for the large whale of the LA to pick up not just on where we might be, but everybody else. And I just, uh, picking up a point that Tim made half an hour ago about pace, I'm not only the pace of where we are, but the pace of 20 or 30 other bodies working with LAs. It, do we actually know whether but we're just lined up in some form of competition with every other body to deliver a more efficient service and so we're trying to get to be in the first three of getting us done um, it, A, are all other bodies doing what we're doing or we, do we happen to be first in line or are we tenth in line but somewhere I've got a much broader concern I suppose than what you've said to us so far uh, bearing in mind wherever we get to the LA's may be nowhere near where we might be. So I suppose the final point in that is 
how the LAs work back with us, with, with us and what presentation they would be making right now to their top team about where we might be. So I don't want us just to be in isolation. No, and I think that's a really good point. And in actual fact, um, I'm going to park that question, Clive, if I may, until we reach um, Louise's presentation on stakeholder engagement, because that's what the whole communications and stakeholder engagement activities that underpin our program are. They're not just about giving information out to local authorities or to other stakeholders. They're not just about listening to what's coming in from the ground. They're about working with all of the other government departments who are doing similar kinds of work with us, drawing them in. We're actually drawing in HSE, for example. We're doing a review of the work that other regulators are doing, um, both to see what lessons we can learn, but also to understand what the landscape is, because that landscape is changing as well, and people are reacting to that in different ways. So if you don't mind, I'm going to park those concerns and questions, because I believe that we will actually pick up on those when we hit the evidence gathering activities and when we talk about the stakeholder <coughs> engagement. Andrew. Sorry, sorry to uh, extend this, uh, <laughs> extend your anxiety around it, but I do think that there's a real issue about understanding the rationale for this that I'm not sure that is necessarily understood, and and I guess I'm I'm quite puzzled by this conversation because what I want to check is am I hearing from the board that there is a reticence against gathering evidence on this. Um, over the last 12 years, this has probably been one of the key areas where the board has consistently felt we've had the weakest handle on information about food safety. And it's quite interesting to, to think about how we spend money on the IID study that costs several millions of pounds. 5.5 million, Andrew. 5.5 to be precise because we needed to improve the quality of our evidence base to understand public health, public safety. So I guess, I guess, I mean, you know, we spend a lot of money on Campbell back to IID, National Diet Nutritionist, I mean, several millions of pounds. And I think what's being proposed is, is a project that is trying to improve our understanding and evidence base around how official controls are being delivered. And what I'm hearing, and I want to check whether I'm hearing this incorrectly, is a real reticence from board members that we should be doing this work. And I just want to check whether that's correct or not. In, having raised one of the evidence things, I'm absolutely 100% not. Uh, a point I was concerned about is, is the rationale being driven by evidence or subjunctive, uh, sorry, subjective comments made by the LGA. That's a, a different thing. Can I come back on that as well? Because I certainly support the fact we need to have the, the, the evidence, but you yourself said gathering the evidence is the first phase of this. So I think from, as a board member, I'm not quite sure what this official review of controls is. For me, I thought we'd agreed that we'd gather evidence to know whether there was a problem. But a lot of the language used is suggesting that we're gathering evidence because we've already got an agenda. Now, and sorry, you use that evidence gathering is the first phase. Yeah, to, me, to me, that is the project, gathering the evidence so that at some point we can have a look as to see what is broke, what isn't broke. And, I think, I th and that is where I think the, the communication is going wrong because it seems to be, there seems to be a, a, a project beyond the evidence. Now, and the FSA, I think, falls apart. We should, we should gather the evidence and then have a look at policy. And, and, and I think there's a, there seems to be some sort of policy out there assuming we're, we're starting to assume the evidence. Can, uh, I, uh, can, can I, I put that challenge in? Yeah, but can I come back on that? Because I, I know of no example through the 12 years history of the FSA where we have operated as an organisation in that way, where we have ignored evidence or we've set out with a, a project to gather evidence to do that. And I, and I absolutely n do not recognise that in this project. So I, I'm absolutely puzzled by that concern that you're expressing. I mean, clearly you all feel that, but, uh, but as someone who's responsible for <laughs> evidence gathering in the agency, I don't see it. Can I make, I mean, I, I, I do agree with Tim's point and with, with Margaret's point as well, but I, mean, I suppose one of the things that I feel troubled by 
is, is the fact that at kind of every cut and turn, there, there's this claim that we don't have enough evidence of this. We don't have enough evidence of this. And yet there must be built up information from audits and from various data that we've had over time. Jim, there just the, isn't. The more, the, well, I mean, it I seems can't, very surprising. I, I can't stress this strongly enough. I, I, I wish that, that I could. I that's surprising. That's I'm, what I, I find. I'm just going to so, hand over to Andrew yeah. because it may be surprising to you. It was surprising to me as someone who came from outside the official but, control delivery framework. I mean, but it's there. Let, and there's no point in ignoring the elephant in the room, well, which is that we don't have enough evidence let, to do let it. Let me be clear. It, it, it's not a question of, of not finding the evidence. I, I, I believe that we need to have the evidence. In fact, some of the information you presented already gives evidence, gave evidence of where you see what the problems actually are. And it seems to me important that we, we do have that. I just am surprised, frankly, that that's not available over, over the 12 years that we've had. And, and, and I just am okay with, with, with this. Now, I do think it's important that once you have that evidence, and I still believe that there's quite a lot that we have, although I'm prepared to be corrected with that. It's then a question of saying, well, once you have that evidence, what do you do about it? What is the policy that follows from that? Um, I would prefer not to have a position where we determine what that policy will be, or we go you kind of full speed in terms of what these options and other policies might be until we know where we are with that. Because the fact of the matter is, that there isn't a lot of money around anywhere. You know, these, there are going to be budget reductions, but there isn't going to be money around anywhere. And that's part and parcel of the business of why government is saying, look, we have to live more within our means. And things have to start, you know, being stretched, etc. And the question is, how you cope with that? And I just slightly worry that we have that we that we we have a discussion or assume certain things about what policy action we might take before we actually have the evidence in front of us. I just slightly worry about that. Okay, well I think the point that you've made, I will hand over to Andrew in a moment just for him to, to address the issue about why don't we have the evidence when we've been around for 12 years. Um, but take it from us, we've done a lot of work looking at the evidence that we have and it isn't sufficient and I think our external advisory group also were very strong in, in making that point um, to us and uh, when, when we had our initial meeting with them. Yeah, but could I suggest you ask um, yeah. Clive and Sarah just now if their impression is that the policy decision is leading the evidence gathering exercise, I think their input could be um, interesting and valuable for board members. Sarah and Clive. Can you hear us okay? Yep. Um, I think it wouldn't be, first say we're sitting here with a degree of incredulity. Um, we should also say we've got no vested interest in the FSA whatsoever. But uh, to hear uh, this conversation is uh, very worrying to our minds and it's where we've been for the last two years. We asked the officials what was the state of play in terms of uh, foodborne illness in the UK and we got very cons inconsistent answers. We asked for confirmation about the degree of delivery across the country and there's a patchwork of information there and uh, that kind of leads us to ask, ask the question what the board's been doing for 12 years given you, you don't have the information. And so uh, we put our foot down <clears throat> and said we wouldn't be party to a process that uh, was based on incomplete evidence. Um, we've got no agenda. You guys may have an agenda, but you don't have the information to make a decision. Uh, before today, we didn't realize that there may actually be local corruption involved. So that to uh, refer to your chairman's uh, question. But believe me, if a food scare happens, you are not in control of it. Can, can I just add a bit about um, do we think that predetermined policy um, is leading the sort of evidence gathering? <coughs> And I, for one, am very clear it's not. Um, and we've been very clear about that as a group as well. What we want to see is the evidence. What we want you as a board to do is review that evidence and decide how to take that forward at the right time. But all of the members of EAG shared a huge concern on your behalf about the lack of consistent evidence that you could base any future decisions on. So we were very clear that we, as Clive said, we don't owe anything to the FSA. We are not partisan either for officers or for board members. But we do have a concern. The reason that we agreed to sit on the EAD is we have a concern for consumers, of which we are too. 
So we want to know that you're working well to protect the consumers. And I've heard a lot of that this morning. So I think, I don't know if that reassures you, annoys you or whatever, but we've already annoyed the officials, so if we annoy the board as well, then that shows that we're at least equal-handed. But well, certainly, you need the evidence. Yeah, can I annoy Sorry. everybody else then, as we're recording? Let's get it clear about this. When the CSR was being planned, we had an option that we seriously discussed of a takeover of local government food enforcement. And we were going to take it over and get the savings out of it, and we were going to offer that up to the Treasury. That was one of the options. It was discussed. It's not written down. It probably is written down somewhere. That was the reality. We've moved away from that. Let's get it clear. But the fact is, we did discuss that. And that Jeff? was a plan in 2010. So it is to and answer Andrew's point, really. That's the elephant in the room, in a way because that was the suspicion levelled against us, there was a reality to that. Now, we tried to kill that off. I mean, it's hardly raised in my visits to local government now. But we might as well get it out in the open. That was one of the options. No evidence. It was going to be done at the CSR, and we estimated we could get several... Well, we could get more than our budget back out of this, because we knew the estimated cost $290 million, and we could take a lot of back office costs out of the system, of which local government is taking out of themselves now. The other thing that's missing, in terms of evidence, we went to the extent of doing the conference in December 2010, and it's only last week I discovered, number one, the proceedings have never been published. I came across a draft of them last week. All the table comments from about 150 people, Margaret, you were there. There's about five comments questioning local government. I've just God, only gone through without any time. So in terms of evidence, the proceedings were never published. I don't know why. It was a joint conference between us and the Chartered Institute in December 2010 when Tim announced the review. So in terms of evidence, we had all the stakeholders in the room, manufacturers, local government, enforcers. There was hardly any pressure along this. Now I'm saying that's only two years ago. The landscape's changed and it's right. My last point is this. We did a desktop exercise in Wales at the request of the Welsh Government. Was there a correlation between their performance and outcome and what they were spending on food safety? Difficult to get. It was done in about three months. It told us there wasn't a correlation, but there were some issues. Why couldn't we do the same of England? We didn't. We started on this Royal Commission exercise. That's the worry and concern of the board the time it's taken. If we were at this stage now, 12 months ago, then the attitude and the questions wouldn't be the same. Can I point out, Jeff, that there are 22 local authorities in Wales. There are, therefore, 430-odd extra local authorities that we have to gather that information from. And one of the great difficulties that we have as an organisation, and that's why we do not have an immediate understanding of that shifting landscape in front of us is because the vast majority of those local authorities do not respond to a lot of our requests for information. Now, when you work in Scotland or Northern Ireland or Wales, you can actually pull all of those people into a room with you and you can badger them into making sure that they respond to you. And in fact, we have much easier access to information in each of the devolves. The landscape in England is enormous. Plus, the remit of what we as a team were asked to do in both the January and the July board meeting is broader than what you're just talking about right there. And that is perhaps the other issue that we haven't considered. We've been talking here about the rationale, but you actually, we haven't had a chance to cover with you, which was the next section of the presentation, was about what actually the program was asked to look at. And although, and I completely take your point, that there was the discussion of a predetermined outcome, when myself and the other members of this team joined it, the, it was very, very clear that at the board's insistence at the January discussion, that that review had no predetermined outcomes, none whatsoever. And I personally don't care what the executive's pet projects are. That's not my business. My business is delivering an, uh, an assessment to you, or Catherine's business in actual fact, um, is delivering an assessment to you of the current system, what the problems with it are, what the fixes to that might be, and if we think the system is, is really in trouble, what alternate 
me methods we might use to deliver those official controls. Now, one of the reasons that we've set the program up is because the assessment process for actually assessing the baseline and the evidence that we're gathering to do that is exactly the same as the evidence that you use to do option development and appraisal. So it doesn't actually make any sense in it from a timing perspective and from getting the most value for money out of the people that you've got sitting in this room working on this project to actually do those two things in a, in a sequential manner, which is one of the things I was going to talk about, but we're kind of in there now. So, um, you know, so there's a very good reason why the program is organised the way it is. It's organised to fulfil the remit that was given at the January board and the expansion of that to make sure that we look at the, uh, any unintended consequences of change um, that was particularly emphasised at the July board. Um, and that's why the program has developed the way it has. Now, if the remit had been given, go away and look at the evidence of just look at the evidence as to how the, the system is functioning at the moment, we'd still have to do pretty much the same piece of evidence gathering because the evidence gathering is all dictated by the holes largely that we have uh, in the information that we gather from local authorities about how they deliver, how they prioritise, what systems they use, how much resource they devote to it, how the finances work, etc. So that's what we're filling and we have to fill that to do the assessment of the current system properly, rigorously. Now, we can do a quick surface skim and pick out a few little faults that, that come to the surface, and we can stick a band-aid over those if that's what people want to do. But the fact is, this is a systematic review. We have the time and at the moment before the system fails because we're reasonably confident that it is chugging along okay with problems at the moment. But, so we have the time to do it properly now. Um, and that's why we should do it properly now, because what we don't want to do is just put in a few patchwork fixes without really understanding if there are systematic problems that are underlying that. And, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I had a great job running the foodborne disease strategy. I didn't need to go and join Catherine's team and, and you know, for, to keep myself occupied. I had a challenging strategic job. I moved into this because my concerns around this are that if what is going on in local authorities in terms of delivery of official controls is not what we've always assumed it to be, that is, you know, reliable, consistent, relatively effective, and if that changes, everything that I build as part of the FDS falls in a big hole because you're, you're building a house on foundations of quicksand. So, you know, to me, that, that rationale is, is there. And the reason the program looks the way it does is because of what we were actually asked to do at the January and July board meetings. And I, I don't know if, if we really have time to sort of go through that part of the presentation now, but I'm very happy to sort of discuss that with you. Um, Andrew, you obviously, I'm sorry, I've been meaning to come back to you for a while. It's all right, so I've got very thick skin. Um, on this particular issue, um, I feel sort of slightly vulnerable because I'm the one responsible for the delivery at the end of it all through local authorities and a lot's been said about conjecture and contradictory evidence so I'll tell you how it looks to me I can tell you a series of facts and these are not conjecture, they're facts delivery is inconsistent it is, fact we've got the evidence to demonstrate it's inconsistent we can't and I'd never have audited all of England there's too many local authorities, there's too difficult a mixture, and we don't, have, we don't have the good justification to audit all of England. I can't tell you that that's even necessary. Interventions have changed. There are less full audits of businesses now than there used to be. Um, the interventions are now different. There are a good level of interventions on high-risk businesses, but the interventions on lower-risk businesses are falling off. And I can't tell you if there are now more high-risk businesses that are simply not being detected because they're not being visited. The experience is tremendously variable between local authorities, and it depends on geography. Areas with big tourist industries tend to give a greater focus on food safety than those without, but that's not universal. We are seeing, for a fact, more local authorities falling into the failing category than we used to, and I've seen that increase in the time that I've been here. The funding is lower, and it will continue to be lower, and that's a fact. The data itself, as John picked out, is contradictory. Some of the data says some areas have got better, other areas have got worse, and they do contradict each other. I can't tell you if any of that matters. I can't say to you that the system is secure, and I can't say to you the system is not secure. We're talking about £200 million worth of delivery. That's twice the size of the whole of the FSA, probably more than twice the size of it. We need a good amount of evidence to take on a decision, whatever that decision is on this. 
And if this review weren't happening, then I would have to say something to the board about needing to review this, because I cannot demonstrate through what I'm seeing in the inconsistencies that the system is secure, and I can't tell you that it's not. And if there was a massive outbreak today, tomorrow, or next week, I couldn't tell you whether or not we could have detected it or not. I can tell you the broad trends that are happening, but that's it. And we've only had leans data for three years. So yes, there can be a discussion about where we were for the previous nine years, and that's thankfully before my time. But as I look at it now, we, we know it's a difficult system. We just don't know if it matters or not. And given that there are well over half a million businesses affected by that, which is considerably more than the 353 that we directly regulate, and the thousand cutting plants that we visit on a, on a certain basis, then we should be taking a good look at this. And it may be that there's nothing wrong. I think that's unlikely from the experience that we've got so far. But that's why this is necessary. From my point of view, I agree with some of the comments that have been made as to whether or not we can prove, one, prove things one way or another. And that's why this is necessary. From a delivery point of view, we have a lack of assurance. And that is my, uh, that's what I would say to you as a board. We have a lack of assurance. Gail, could I just make a comment? I'm going to yes. make this comment as a board member rather than my previous roles, but I can't unknow what I know from my time in the For those people who group. might not know, Liz used to be part of our EAG. So. So, so I get some of my background information comes from that. But to go back to your point, Andrew, I want that evidence. That's my personal view. I want that evidence to make decisions. So I support the gathering of that information for two reasons. One is I, I, I want... I, I need the comfort of it to make decisions. And the other thing, um, I'm guessing here that food safety will have a higher priority within local authorities if this piece of work takes place. So when they're picking off the areas where they can make cost savings, we might stand a better chance, and this is my priority on this board, that consumer protection through food safety in local authorities is higher up the priority order within LEs than if we don't do it and we sit back quietly. So that's my two reasons to support. I think that's uh, very well said, Liz, and I, I go along wholeheartedly with that. I, I have never had any doubts at all that we need to gather information. I may have had some doubts about some of the detail, but that's, that, I'm not a scientist, so I, I defer to those who know better. But we need to be presented with that evidence in a very unambiguous way. And we don't want any coat trailing that's suggesting at any stage that we've already reached a decision or some people have already reached the decision. The evidence should be presented in a manner that enables the board to come to a decision based on that evidence, not based on conjecture or anecdote or asides or views expressed by those with vested interests. And that's my sole and singular concern. And on that basis, I'm more than happy that we proceed and I'm more than happy that we, to follow Andrew's lead, that we, we use that evidence to reach a sensible decision. But the evidence is the lead, and we don't want policy being formulated ahead of the evidence being presented and gathered. No, uh, we certainly aren't in dis disagreement with that at all. That's entirely how the program is constructed. Part of the reason that we are doing the option development alongside assessing the current system, and to be perfectly honest with you, I see fixes or improvements to the current system as part of one of the options. Um, part of the reason that we're doing that contiguous with, uh, with the, the, the actual work to gather the evidence is so that this doesn't turn into a Royal Commission, Jeff. Trust me. We're trying to do this as quickly as we can. That means we're doing a lot of things at once. We could have easily strung this out over four or five years. I could quite happily have spent three years gathering this evidence. I'm spending just over a year, and part of that time is in procuring getting it done, which is a fixed time period that I can't change. So I think it's really important to recognise that um, part of the reason that we're exploring the options as we go along is not because we have any predetermined outcomes about this. It's not because we already think one of those is better than any of the others. It's simply because it makes sense to do this at a single time. I think given the level of discussion that we've actually had. I'm going to skip through the next couple of slides really, really quickly, which are just a brief reminder of the decision. And in January 2011, all of this kind of stuff was, I'm assuming, discussed then. This was obviously well before I joined the program. But the discussion came to the point was that a review was needed, but it needed to be principle and outcome based 
have no predetermined outcomes, assess the current system and scope potential improvements, as well as developing and testing alternate delivery options against the evidence base, that it should be overseen by the independent panel, which is why we have the EAG, which Liz was a member of and Clive and Sarah still are, and that it needed to be done in partnership in consultation with key stakeholders. And so we went away and did an awful lot of work in that six months. And I say we in the royal sense there, because that was really Catherine, Kerry and Jonathan back at the time who was working with Catherine on this. It was before the rest of us joined the program in developing um, all of the, the, the um, systems that we'd actually need to, 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 to do the work that, that we were asked to do that was given in that remit through that, that January board paper. A really critical part of this actually was around program, planning the program in terms of developing the principles and outcomes because this was actually the first time that we as an organisation really have actually articulated in this quite clear way what we want from a delivery system. So that was a really a first principles piece of work that needed to be done and we really consulted on those very extensively to make sure that we got this, that our stakeholders essentially agreed with us about what a delivery system should look like and what the outcomes of it should be. We also needed to decide what was in and what was out of the review. So what controls were we actually talking about? Are we just talking about the delivery of stuff that's actually articulated in a very specific sense in Regulation 882? Or are we actually talking about the broader work that, uh, that um, our, those skilled professionals do in supporting business, giving them advice and guidance? Because we know actually to a degree that that's quite important for helping improve compliance. So we had to develop what the scope of, of the review was going to be. Um, and then Kerry and Jonathan in particular undertook to look at in some detail what the evidence was that we held internally and what the gaps in that were. And that's where we constructed our initial indicative high level program plan that set out the stages that you'd need to go through um, in order to take forward the remit that was given in the January paper. Now this is predicated on some assumptions, of course it is, like any project plan. Um, it's predicated on the fact that we were doing an assessment and option development at the same time, which was what was asked of us. Um, it was also predicated on the assumption that there would be a decision, a recommendation that you were asked to make a decision on that recommended something. So it's recommending a change of some description. We may come to you in actual fact and go, well, no change is necessary. But like Andrew, I think that's fairly unlikely because any system can be improved, even if it's just the systems we have internally as an organisation. So we're going to be coming to you with a decision about something. Um, what that something is, we have absolutely no idea at the moment. We need the evidence before we can make some decisions about what that, that decision, that recommendation should be that we come to you with. And in this high-level plan, we'd initially uh, anticipated completing that in September 2012 and coming to you for that decision. In the latest version of the project plan that you saw in the March board paper, which I know was of concern to you because it's uh, around the timescales, was looking at a completion date, coming to you with that decision now in July 2013. And the primary reason for that really was our recognition that we needed much more evidence than we'd initially thought to really do the assessment of the current system rigorously, that we were lacking much of the information that we actually needed. And when that was planned out, how long it was going to take to gather that in, we recognised that we couldn't meet that initial high-level indicative timeline that we'd given you. Um, Inherent in that, which I think Sarah and Clive have already mentioned, was the challenge that they gave to the executive and the, the project team as it was at the time, saying, you aren't resourced to deliver this evidence and there's a lot of it that you need to get. And at this point, I'd just like to ask if Sarah and Clive want to make any, any further comments before I move on to the next section or whether you feel that you've, you've already said what you wanted to say. Oh, Sarah, we can't hear you. Oh, no, we've lost the... No, we've lost... It's off, I think. Can you hear me now? Ah, yep, yeah, we can. I was only saying, Gail, I think you should press on. But we did make the point about um, the lack of resourcing. And, Jeff, we shared your concern about lack of pace at that time. And I have to say that has changed in the last six months. But at that time, there was a lack of pace. There was a lack of resources devoted to the project. I'm sorry, just the other thing we felt, there was no point taking a snapshot in terms of data collection. That is, you should actually create a sort of legacy or a longitudinal program of data collection so you don't reach this impasse in the future. 
Great. Thanks very much, guys. So essentially, that brought us to the place where we came back to you in March, which was a revised program plan with... Oh, yep, Louise really reminded me that I will destroy the technology if I touch the board. <laughs> so that we came back to you, that we would be now coming back to you in July 2013 with the outputs from that evidence put through the assessment process that Kerry's going to talk to you, talk you through briefly uh, in a moment to allow us to understand what the current state of play was, what changes, if any, might be necessary, and which ones came out best through the uh, option appraisal process, so that you as the board in July 2013 will be in the position where you're going to be able to make an informed decision about what the best way forward is, um, whatever, however minor or major, that potential change might need to be. Yeah. Yep. Oh, I'm really sorry, Margaret. I just wondered if we could get copies that actually have much less. Oh, I'm sorry, in the pack. Yeah. You'd like full size there. slides. Or even there. I can't. I, the, the really full screens, I, I can't make them out. So, could we have co copies at some point? Yeah, that, no problem. Um, yeah. We'll organise to make sure just that you get it's quite important stuff. And you can because I'd love to see because you stood in front of the thing. I'm sorry about that. I don't think there's anywhere good for me to no, stand. There is, there is, <laughs> but you seem to bring the options to the board. But actually, I'd quite like to see the output of the evidence as, so we could discuss that before the options come to us. Well, what we're actually planning on doing is the evidence gathering should be completed by about January 2013. We're due to come to you with a progress report in, ja in March 2013. Um, so I'd be very happy to come and present the outputs of the, um, the evidence program um, to you at that point. And in fact, one of the things we'd hope to finish this session was with how can we make sure that you are informed enough about what we're actually doing doing and, and, and you know, what the detail of the program is so that you are in, feel that you're in a position to make that informed decision and you know, do we, for example, need to do another closed briefing session with you um, a bit further down the track when we've got some of the evidence in and we actually have something that we can really discuss in detail with you to make sure that you're up to speed. So we wanted to finish today off with that sort of conversation about how you'd like us to interact with you going forward because given the importance of this piece of work, we need to make sure that you fully understand what we've done, how we've done it, what the evidence is, what it all means, so that you can make the best decision for consumer protection that, that can be made. So that's really where we are now. You signed off on the principles and outcomes, and those have been morphed, if you like, into our a part of our evaluation matrix that is being used to assess our baseline once we get our evidence in. You discussed the evidence needs, and we've had a very long and, and uh, forthright, I think, discussion about that this morning, um, and that you agreed that animal feed really needed to be progressed more quickly, because that is a system that we know is seriously failing, um, and that we really have to go out and address right now to make sure that consumers are protected. So that gives us the sort of quick trot through the program. One thing that you did ask us about um, was about the cost of the program. How much is this costing to do? Up until the end of that evidence gathering phase and when we come back to you for that decision point in, um, in July 2013, um, we're looking at a cost of about three million pounds. By the way, don't interrupt because I think clearly the area has been really positive. It's the first time we've ever seen any financial information. Now that is a big mistake because that's part of what caused the problem in March. We've never seen anything on the finances which we're signed up to and yeah. responsible for. Just so that you're aware, that's the first time we've seen that. Yeah, I mean, I think our assumption as a team was that it's EMB's job um, as our program board to sign off our finances and everything. So I don't think for a start we actually realised necessarily the board would want to look at that. But also, um, at the time of the March board, which was the first time I sort of really came across this, I was right in the middle of working up contracts with a variety of research contractors and I actually couldn't give the game away because what happens is if you tell them how much money you've got to spend, so for example, even if we said our program overall is costing £3 million, they will then work back from that as to I reckon that means they've got this much to spend, so I'm only going to tailor what I put into a proposal to them to meet that amount of money rather than saying this is the remit that they want us to deliver to them, this is how much it will cost. So unfortunately, at that particular point in time, we couldn't really share um, the program costs because doing that would have influenced whether we could contract good evidence gathering um, projects. But of course, we could have done that 
in the closed board sessions earlier with you, we could have sent this as an information paper or something, for example, and, you know, hold our hands up. We didn't do that quick enough. Um, and this is where we are now. So most of the cost of the program is actually in us. It's having the skilled people there um, with the knowledge and expertise to do the work. Around 850,000 of that, this is going to potentially change a little bit over time, is what we call program spend. About um, a big chunk of that is the research projects, the externally contracted research projects, and um, a smaller amount of that is really the work that Lou leads on um, the stakeholder engagement because we run a lot of workshops and we go out and visit a lot of people. It's actually a relatively small amount of money when you think about the amount of money that we have to spend on making, on actually delivering these controls and the work that we do to support it. And in terms of how it compares to other programs uh, across the organisation, it's a much, much smaller amount of spend, for example, in terms of program cost and science and evidence than the program I used to run for the, the FDS. I mean, the FDS is planning about six and a half million pounds of program spend alone this year. And then you can add in the sort of 15 to 20 staff admin costs that go along with running that program and delivering that enormous quantity of work. So there's more information in your pack, actually. I've put in some details about the costs of the individual research projects. Again, we're still in the process of contract negotiation over one of those, so I didn't actually want to articulate those as this would need to be removed from the record today. So what we plan to do now was actually run you through um, the work streams um, that we've got to deliver the actual process. And I think we've only got an hour left now. Um, but I think we'll be able to cover that and have the, the discussion that, that you're probably going to want to have with us about that. I think the critical bit here, actually, is what Kerry's going to talk to you about, which is the assessment and appraisal process. Because I hope what this will explain to you guys is how assessing the current system and developing alternative options are intimately linked and also are a process that you go through and this doesn't sound like we're taking it seriously, but we really are. It's a, it's a process that you go through as an intellectual exercise um, that you divorce yourself from what the outcome of that might actually be. And that's where the having no predetermined outcome to this process really comes in. Because although we may look at a range of options, we actually are divorcing ourselves from whether we think any of those options are any better or worse than the current system then until we actually get the, the, the evidence in. So at this point, I really want to hand over to Kerry and ask her to take you through this. Okay. Well, I'll try and whip through this as quickly as I can because I think a lot of what I was going to originally cover has already been discussed. But essentially, for me, the assessment and appraisal process that's in the review is really what's going to underpin um, the recommendations and provide you with the information, analysis and evidence as um, Liz said, that, that will reassure you that any recommendations you reach are going to, going to be reliable and they're going to be there to protect um, consumers through the official control delivery system as it goes on. And it's not only important for your recommendations, but unlike um, Tim's example of how you might run it in the private sector, it's not just ourselves that we need to convince in this. There's a wide range of stakeholders around there. And by following this very logical, structured approach to um, establishing our rationale, setting the objectives for the system, assessing the current system and alternative options, whether they're fixes or more radical changes, against those criteria uh, has really been instrumental um, for Lou's work in taking stakeholders along and really demonstrating to them that this actually hasn't got any predetermined outcomes no matter where we started from at the beginning of the process. And also, the other fact to consider is that we're not necessarily going to be decision makers for implementing the recommendations that are taken forward. So by using this approach, which follows the standard government practice that you'll be familiar with in the sort of impact assessments and business cases that you see day in, day out in your board papers, means that once the recommendations have been reached, we'll already have the material in a format that's ready to put into those types of things and we can start to progress towards implementation. <coughs> so, how do I work this? Oh, there you go. So, you know, the assessment process is not rocket science. It's just following, you know, sensible criteria and approaches in a structured way so that um, 
is we can evidence how and why our decisions are reached. And um, this slide just sets out some of the core poor assessment criteria that, that are taken into account in any sort of appraisal process. So the first of these is efficacy, and then, or is the system really able to do what it was intended to do um, and has the means available to undertake the activity? And if you think about animal feed, then this is clearly where that has fallen down at the moment. It doesn't seem to be the case based on what we've got already for food. Um, but if you can't demonstrate that, then there's little point going on to look at things like efficiency and effectiveness, and that's part of the reason why that work got escalated out of the programme. But obviously, cost is going to be a consideration in the process, and there we're looking at the total cost of what's being delivered, but also how efficiently the, the, the resource within the system is being allocated. <coughs> Excuse me. And then, obviously, you couldn't do any assessment without looking at the effectiveness of the system. And for us, that's in its ability to achieve its overarching aim of consumer protection. And as everyone's been talking already a lot, there's no point of fixing just the problems that were there last year or there at the moment. Any recommendations need to be sustainable for the future. And that's both sustainable in terms of change that might happen in the delivery landscape, but also within the food chain, which is rapidly changing day by day. So you'll recognise that these are kind of reflected in our principles and outcomes for the review. And they also try and capture, as Gail said, the, um, really the requirements of the system as well. And so that's what we're using as the basis of the appraisal <coughs> approach. And these are also what we used back at the beginning to sort of set out what our evidence needs were. Easily, I've got a sore throat. <coughs> so um, the team went at the back at the beginning of the project. The team went around and consulted quite widely within the agency to find out so what information is out there that we can draw in already. And there's lots, as you've heard today, anecdotal information about where change is happening, but not an awful lot that lets us say, okay, this variability is there, but how much is it, and is it an issue? and all these, these authorities are grouping together and starting to share services, but what does that really look like? And where in the country is that happening and how prevalent is that? So while we have got lots of signals that things are going on, we can't really get our hands on it and sort of say, well, this is the size of it or this is actually what it looks like. But these are the sources that we do have. So there's the local authority enforcement and monitoring system and that gives us data on um, the, the activities that local authorities have done. It gives us a snapshot of compliance and it gives us an idea about FTEs that are out there. <coughs> so if you think back to the criteria, that provides us with some evidence on the extent that controls are, are happening and also some of the information that we need to start to analyse efficiency and effectiveness of the system. As you've all mentioned, we've also got the results of the audit programme. And while they're not comprehensive and don't cover every local authority, they give us an idea about where they might be failing, <coughs> the areas that they might be failing in, um, or not, and where there's good practice, and the sorts of types of issues that they're finding, and how long or how quickly um, local authorities are able to respond to those. And the regional teams, we've spoken quite a lot about those again today, as well today, and they, they're gathering, <coughs> they're much more rapid in, in the information that they're getting, but it's collected kind of anecdotally and as and when it, people, they meet people out on their day-to-day -day work. They, it's not collected systematically by approaching authority by authority to, to develop a comprehensive picture of what's going on in the UK. So we've looked at other government departments and what information they've got, and we already had a discussion back at the start of the day about the financial information that each of the devolved administrations collects from their authorities on financial reporting. <coughs> um, most of them do require some reporting at the level of food safety. I think it's just Scotland that doesn't. Um, 
but at the, that level of detail, the data is really, really patchy. There's lots of missing values there from authorities where we know that there's activity happening. And if you look through time, the amount of money that they're saying they spend varies enormously. <coughs> and that's just for food safety. There's no line in there for, trade, um, for food standards, which gets reported <coughs> together with the rest of the trading standards work. And then finally, the service delivery plans in, that local, we require local authorities to put together. And um, they contain some information about what their plan work is over a coming year, their objectives as an organisation, and I think also some, normally some background information about the context of that authority. Excuse me, my throat's going again. Can I just give you time then to... Yeah, yeah. On the regional prisons unit... <laughs> I mean, is it, I, I really, by the way, I realise I think we're only talking about eight people. I, I do appreciate that. I, I have fantastic um, admiration for them. But surely, if, for example, the changes that are taking place out there, when I went to Worcester recently and discovered the six district councils are no longer doing food, mm -hmm. they've set up the Worcester Regulatory Authority, they employed, they took out the same. Now, when those kind of things happen, don't our regional prisons unit know what's happening in the local authorities in the region? We say it's, it, it's got to be more than anecdotal. It's got to be a bit more systematic than that, that they, they must know what's actually happening. I think Andrew's put his light on to yes, that one. That, yes, they do. They have their regional food leads meetings where that sort of thing gets disseminated. We also have a, a policy of meeting with all local authorities at least once every year. It's usually more often than that to find out those sorts of things that are going on. So yes, they do know. What we don't know in detail is the impacts of some of those changes, and uh, that's something that, that we'll see over time. But banding together of uh, different authorities and their different functions has been going on for many years. We've seen, it, uh, we've seen it an awful lot in different parts of the country, and particularly in London in, in, in the last few years. So yes, they do pick up on, on all of those things, and their regular reports are disseminated within the agency. What we don't have is the more systematic analysis of um, the impacts of these things and the data, because there are a small number of people. But yes, the, the changes are we are aware of. It's just worth mentioning, by the way, because uh, Paul's not with us today. Paul was yeah. new board member. He serves as a member of the Boundary Commission for England. They apparently are very concerned about what's happening mm. of all these informal, semi-formal arrangements of local government because it's been done without any effect of the boundaries. And there's obviously there's a democratic system here that they're responsible for overseeing. So when we were discussing this briefly, I mean, at one mm. meeting briefly, he did say, by the way, there's some warning bells going on with the Boundary Commission. So we might get back to DCLG to try and stop, in fact I'll put a question, I don't, I don't do any questions about the FSA in part, but I've actually got a question now about asking have ministers ever stopped local government since 2010 trying to join up services, uh, but that was born out of what Paul told me about the worry about the Boundary Commission. And I think it's the same worry that we actually have in, in terms of what Andrew has actually said, is that they're going ahead and doing this. They're not actually informing us necessarily when it happens or involving us in the discussions around sure. that. They're waiting until our regional team comes to them to have a conversation and then they go, oh, by the way, we're doing this and we've decided we're going to do that without any reference to um, the impact that that has on, on uh, our need to make sure that that system is working effectively for consumer protection. Yeah. And it's probably worth saying that um, within Andrew's area, there is some work going on to, to more formally map out those types of different um, ways of working out and to start to try and evaluate those. But that's outside of, of our bit of work here. So, um, yeah, so we're already under work on these bits of evidence and pulling them together is already underway, either within business as usual, as I've mentioned, um, within the review team and also some of the evidence gathering projects are drawing these together but we've mentioned some limitations of these so a lot of them are just kind of indicative rather than um, quantitative or really getting underneath what's really happening and there's inconsistencies in how things are reported as Andrew mentioned um, even our lane system when the auditors go out and follow up some um, 
things that seem to look odd in there, either very low inspection rates or very, very high or poor um, compliance scores, it actually ends up being an issue of reporting rather than an, an actual issue of performance. Um, the timeliness of the information is key. Um, service delivery plans, for example, are, we've had a, um, some of the researchers are looking through those at the moment. They relate to all sorts of different time periods and they're not centrally held here um, at the FSA. They're in local authorities on their websites um, in the process of being approved by their members. They're in all different states, so it's not very easy to pull them together um, in a way that shows this is what it's telling you at the moment. Our own LEAMS data, as you're probably all aware, is historic. Um, so it's looking at what happened last year and I think a real concern for Clive and EAG was that in this fast-paced changing environment we're in now where money's going down, past performance is no indication of what's happening in the current year, let alone um, year two, three, for the end of CSR. <coughs> and we've already talked about quite a lot of these gaps. So it, lanes, for example, or the... <coughs> All the, um, the, the intelligence that's been captured in RP in the regional presence teams, they're telling us <coughs> the activity that's happening, but we don't know very much about the context that's happening in local authorities. So we don't know much about the other work that the officers who are doing our controls do in their day-to-day -day business. And that's a risk not only for us in terms of understanding the impact of any change that we might make on those related areas, also how those changes in those areas are going to impact on the, on the things that we're responsible for as an agency. Which I think comes back to Clive's point earlier about what are other regulators doing and how, is, how are we stacking up against that. I think that's a critical point for, for understanding that part of the landscape. And, and the real concern, I think, is the variation that's out there. We've got, you know, from, from the regional presence teams and from people who were previously worked in local authorities, there's a good sense about what these things are, but not really how it works in different places and how those different, the volume and the degree of it. So there's sort of, we've got an idea, but not, not again, not quantitative. And we've spoken a lot about the budgets. We don't know in local, each local authority where the decisions about the food safety budget happens. And we don't know how, how, it, how that budget, once it is given or got, <laughs> however that happens, how it's allocated across the priorities within an area, whether that's focusing on different sectors of the food chain or different areas of risk. We just don't know how those decisions happen. And we're, the other area where we don't have a lot of information is the outcome of, our, um, of the work of the enforcement officers. Now, Lanes gives us a snapshot of compliance at a point in time, but we don't know what types of non-compliance, for example, local authorities are detecting. And that's really hindering any sort of ability, not just for us, but for business as usual, about saying how cost-effective the things um, that are going on in local authorities are. And if a different approach, such, I don't know, perhaps a more educative approach or a harder enforcement-based approach is more cost-effective in the long run for securing and sustaining compliance. <coughs> so in terms of um, the biggest gap for, my, for me, I think, is the, is the, the final one on here. And um, <coughs> we've already spoken about we don't know too much about the budget because they get allocated centrally and decisions happen locally. So it's difficult to get hands on what, how much money is being spent by local authorities um, in its entirety. But we've got some ways to estimate and extrapolate that. But what we don't know is how that resource is allocated within the team. We don't know how much is frontline, how much is support, how much is ma management. We don't know um, how much is spent on enforcement versus inspection. And that's a real limitation for our work. So here, I think um, we're trying to set out the steps of the programme within the assessment process. 
And as Gail's already said, we're running the um, assessing the current system alongside developing options and assessing the options. And that's essentially because, as she said, the same evidence base is required for both. But <coughs> that, that causes um, an issue for, for um, the analysts that we've got a really tight time to able at the end of the project from when the evidence gathers, comes in to when you're making your re recommendations in July. So we're running an initial assessment at the moment to help us get ready, uh, but also to help inform um, option development. And this last slide, I don't know how well it comes out, but it's just trying to demonstrate how the rigor is growing through the process. And that by, pardon? Oh, sorry, <laughs> I almost touched the screen. <laughs> Um, by the time we get to um, the po this point in July, um, at the end of the option appraisal stage, <coughs> that will include um, a full assessment of the current baseline. We will have looked at um, costs and benefits of um, alternative options and fixes to that. We'll have put together material on the wider impacts of those changes and risks and issues that you'll need to know in making your decisions. Um, <coughs> and all that will be kind of in a format, that, as I said, that can be taken forward towards implementation and whatever that needs to support. And that's really it, I think, for me. There's a bit more in your packs actually about what the process of doing the appraisal is. So have a look through that and my contact details are there as well if you have any follow-up questions. Given the fact that Kerry Throat is obviously suffering a bit, does, does anybody have any, any questions for her? I questions. I'm keep drinking water. Um, yeah, Jeff. Yes, I'd like to, um, like to thank you for a uh, very comprehensive introduction to the, um, to the whole topic, which I um, appreciate everybody else is far more advanced than I <coughs> am, um, and um, appreciate the, uh, the background. Um, yeah, I think my question is, is really related to the way in which the programme is being managed. Um, and it struck me at several points as you were going through it that there were um, a number of areas of government where probably this... What, what, one of the key issues, it seems to me, that's, that's, that's being faced here is the probability that there will be less money available in the future to, to ensure consumer safety. Um, and can the quality of what's being delivered be improved? Can that be improved and delivered with less money available? Is my take out anyway of, the, of one of the issues? The other being, is it working effectively at the moment as the start point, which there's a lot of heated debate about? Um, that's not a. a, a it, it's not unique to food safety, is it? That that's, that kind of dilemma is being faced, and I, I was struck with. Uh, at several points with, with parallels potentially with the NHS, which is facing similar, similar issues of trying to ensure improved quality of delivery with the future potential of less money. And I wonder whether, the, whether as from a sort of program board point of view, you'd have the chance to uh, uh, really check the way in which you're approaching this program with, for example, some of the quick programs in the NHS. Uh, which, 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 I mean, it's not exactly parallel, but there seems to me to be a number of, of parallels with what was trying to be achieved. So it's kind of, you know, had you had the chance to look outside food safety um, to see whether the way that you were going about it, you know, were the things to be learned from the way it was being thought about elsewhere or vice versa, really? Yeah, in fact, that actually brings us really nicely onto the evidence gathering work because a big part of, of the work that we're actually doing is looking to see how other systems work, what is actually happening, for example, in other... We, we were particularly focusing on other regulators <coughs> that face many of the same challenges as us and, and how are they actually... What do their delivery systems look like? Are there things that we can learn? How are they changing? So we have uh, quite a lot of engagement work with other government departments to be able to make sure that we're understanding what changes are happening. We're also also looking at that in a much more formal way, which is one of the work strands within the work stream. I think that's an absolutely, you know, 
critical and key point. I have to admit, I hadn't really thought about looking at the NHS, which given the fact that my background is public health, I probably really should have. Um, I think we'd concentrated very much on thinking about the regulatory aspect of this, but you're absolutely right. The NHS and the changes that that is going to face in terms of being able to maintain the quality uh, of service delivery in a resource-constrained environment is, uh, is very, very similar. And that is actually a good point that I will go away and think about without trying to extend the evidence program uh, to make it last any longer than it already does. Um, do we have any other questions for Kerry? Uh, Tim? I might, I might just add a bit to that. The, um, the national regulators and the local regulatory groups meet together fairly frequently and the top line would be that the national regulators have each gone away and tried to figure out how they're best going to deliver uh, in the euphemism that government use, localism and uh, reducing regulation on industry whilst at the same time improving, in our case, public health or in health and safety terms, the number of accidents per visit or whatever it is. And we've come to the conclusion, I think, that whilst we've got lessons to learn from each other, it's a distraction to try and learn too much from each other because the reason we were set up originally, assuming those, those values are still the same, those principles are the same, mean that we're there for a particular purpose, so health and safety and ourselves a good example. And so we keep close, but I'm going to be very intrigued to see what happens in this kind of more formal process of evidence gathering, see whether or not there are things that we could have learnt, and I hadn't thought of the NHS either, guilty as charged, um, but we've certainly talked to all the national regulators, so that's uh, the OFT, Environment Agency, uh, OFT particularly on trading standards matters, um, health and safety executive and so on and each of those we invite each other to consult and each time I think those of us who head those organisations come to the conclusion we have a special purpose and that special purpose can be diluted if we try to sort of merge and combine activities in a way that doesn't actually protect public health. Right, so are there any other questions before I leap into telling you a little bit then about how um, we're aiming to fill the evidence gaps that Kerry's identified as being critical? No? Okay. Right, so this is the program of work. This is a particular piece of work that I lead on in the team. And um, for those of you who don't really know me, you've obviously heard today that I used to manage the foodborne disease strategy. But I actually joined the agency to manage the other big projects that, that we ran as an agency, the second study of infectious intestinal diseases. Um, so I have a lot of experience of managing research, managing research programs within our organisation, and making sure that we do that properly, rigorously, systematically and that that research delivers what we need for you as the board to be able to make the kinds of policy decisions that we need to make. Um, this evidence uh, uh, program has been designed specifically to fill the gaps that are identified in the information that we hold that we need to undertake the, the um, assessment of the current system and the option appraisal. It's also been designed in mind with the fact that there are information gaps out there that are really um, important for our business as usual colleagues to be able to actually fill as well. So because we're doing this evidence gathering, we're trying to encapsulate um, as much of the, the needs of our business as usual activity colleagues as we can. And we'll be looking to disseminate that information rapidly. This is not a program of work where we go away, commission a piece of work, wait 18 months and then get an output from it and then sit on it and don't do anything with it or disseminate it to a small number of people. This is a very actively managed program of work where we're getting information out very rapidly by evidence gathering standards and then disseminating that to the people that we know actually need it as well as ourselves. As we've just discussed, we're looking at it to help identify examples of good practice to scope fixes or improvements to the current model, as well as looking at alternative models. And we're looking at systems within and across the UK where we can learn things. Um, we're also looking internationally at how other regulators particularly develop, uh, deliver food safety official controls. And a really key part of the, the evidence program for me, and for I think this is really what Clive and, and Sarah were emphasising as part of the AG, is this evidence program is designed to help us enhance our horizons, horizon scanning and threat detection. So what we are looking to try and do is we've got a specific 
stream of work looking at um, testing whether the system will be fit for purpose in, in the future, um, making longer term projections. But a lot of the information that we're gathering and trying to gather out of local authorities is actually about short term predictions of where they see their services going. Um, so really, I've organised the evidence program into, into three main strands. We've got developing the baseline, which allows us to assess the current system. Two critical pieces of work going on in here, the first of which is around plugging all those gaps that Kerry highlighted to you in our information base about what's going on in local authority delivery of official controls. The second of which is recognising that we are a central part of that actual overall delivery system is assessing ourselves and our systems. And I know that this was raised at the March board and it, I kind of wish I'd had the opportunity to say, well, in actual fact, I've just been to EMB last week with a paper about how we do this, but um, discussion got, got uh, moved around there. So that's the biggest piece of work. It's what's actually taking us the longest is these projects on local authority delivery to scope all that out. And so those two projects, one of which has already commenced, the other of which is underway, we're expecting to have the, the, the final data set in by January next year. Along with that, we've got the work scoping improvements and developing alternative models, which is where we're really looking at um, food official control delivery by other countries. What systems do they use? How are they organised? What can we learn from that? How translatable would that be into a UK setting? Um, and also looking at, as we discussed, other UK regulators. And now I'll be going away and thinking about how I can maybe look at the NHS too. And then the final sort of piece of strand of work is that horizon scanning work, looking at the sustainability of the system in the short and long term and the suitability of it for the area that we are working in. How well is it going to be suited in a few years' time to delivering consumer protection and to identifying risk and regulating a food chain that is changing quite, quite constantly. There's a couple of pieces of work in there. The short-term information, what's going to happen in the next two or three years around that, we're looking largely to pull out of the, the, the project that we're actually conducting on local authority delivery, um, along with some work that our economists in Kerry's team in, in ARD have undertaken for us, looking at changes to the food industry, mapping that out, looking at where that's going. In the longer term, we have a particular um, piece of project work that's going on um, that we're doing in partnership um, through our membership of the Centre for Environmental Risks and Futures. Is that right, Andrew? The SURF Partnership, um, which is a, an, an initiative across government looking at horizon scanning that, that we as an agency participate in. I think what I'll do, given where we are with time, is I'm going to concentrate on the work that we're doing to develop the baseline and look at local authority delivery. And if anybody has any more questions about the work that we're doing, looking at other delivery systems for scoping improvements and the horizon scanning work, then I'd be very happy to pick up with those um, outside of this meeting with you. And again, my contact details are all in the pack as well, so I welcome anybody giving me a ring to have a chat. But given the fact that it's now five past one and we're starting to get to the end of this, um, I'll concentrate on this aspect of the work, which is assessing the baseline. So essentially, taking as our starting point those evidence gaps that Kerry um, and uh, the analysts had, had identified as necessary to fill for the um, assessment and appraisal process, we worked up research specifications for two externally contracted projects, one of which is a survey, the other of which um, is, um, base, is a series of case studies. The survey will allow us to pick up headline information. It will allow us to get top level information about a range of issues. It's also going to give us the opportunity to ask professionals out in the field how they find our support. So it gives us that opportunity to build in a bit of assessment of ourselves in there as well. That's going to be a very useful piece of work and we're hoping that um, that will be launching right at the beginning of September. The, the project team are already in place for that. They've already gone out and started doing feasibility studies with local authorities to understand how to get the data out of the systems. It's going to be an electronic survey, so we're, they'll be building a platform for that. And in actual fact, once that platform is built, we will be able to re-deliver that survey in the future if we choose to. So it will give us that opportunity to pick up on those signals at other points further down the line. So whatever the decision that's made at the July board meeting in 2013 about what recommendations go forward, we should always have a piece of work that actually allows us to test um, what's going on out there. 
the case studies are really the, the sort of guts of this piece of work because they're designed to go in there and in detail provide all that missing information that Kerry talked you through. We recognise that we're 434 plus or minus a few local authorities uh, across the, the UK and with the diversity that we see across um, the four UK nations that this is actually a really challenging piece of work to do. So what we're doing at the moment is working up in-house what sort of sampling framework we'd like to see. So what we actually need to, to capture here is the diversity in the system. We need to capture the diversity um, within the devolved nations as well as within England we need to capture the diversity across the different types of local authorities and we need to capture the good examples and allow ourselves to assess where those changes have happened like in the Worcester regulatory services. So that's what we'll be designing those case studies really to do. And we're just in the process of contracting that piece of work right at the moment. In fact, the appraisals for the proposals that we've had are this week for that. Um, so those are the, the two sort of really core pieces of work where actually the majority of the information that's needed to undertake the review is going to come from. Um, and that's why they have to be done in the way that we are doing them. They have to be appropriately contracted. It has to go out through an open tender process. That's important for credibility with our stakeholders. We need to make sure that all of our stakeholders are involved and know that this is happening to make sure that they want to participate. And as Louise will tell you, actually, we've got people volunteering to come and take part in these things um, because they want to show us what's happening. Um, and it's important to make sure that we make the appraisal of the proposals for these pieces of work as rigorous as we, as we can afford to in the time that we are available to make sure that they deliver to us at the end of that process the information that we need. We do not want to be going out doing this teeing up local authorities and then have them have to go back to them in six months time and say well actually we missed this and we missed that and we missed the other. Makes us look unprofessional, is unprofessional, but also doesn't allow us to meet the timetable that we've set ourselves and puts extra burden on them. So it's important that we do this rigorously and properly the first time and that we get it right. So I'm not going to sort of apologise for having taken a few months to actually get my head around what was needed and get my team in place and contracting those research projects appropriately because that is entirely the kind of organisation and the rigour that we would expect in the FSA. Both of the projects, are in, uh, we, we're setting them up to involve live data downloads. So the survey, we're already getting the feedback from the feasibility study and some really useful information is actually coming out of, of those um, sort of initial visits to local authorities about issues and systemic problems, difficulties in data gathering, etc. And anything that's coming out, we're feeding, we're not just keeping to ourselves, we're feeding it out to the other teams in the agency who we know would, will find that useful. Once we get the survey um, up and running, and that actually starts, we'll be looking at the data initially to see what kind of response rate we're getting and who is responding more critically. Because with any survey, if you can get a 30% response rate, you're actually doing well. That's not good enough for this piece of work. We need to get as close to 100% as we possibly can. So we're going to have to put a lot of effort in to making sure that we get everybody to respond to this. So that's a really big challenge for us as a team. Um, and one of the things that we'll be doing is analysing who is responding. And as we get towards the end of the survey period, we'll be looking to really pick up and, and, and go out and talk to people about why haven't you responded, we really need you to respond, to, to, to try and build that data um, source up as much as we possibly can. If any systemic problems or issues come out of the data as we're looking at it live, we're not just going to sit on those, obviously. We're going to actually disseminate those to the relevant teams within the agency so that they can take whatever action they need to. And it's not just about systemic problems or issues. I suspect what we're going to actually see coming out of this particular case study work is some really interesting approaches that actually have potentially very good outcomes for food safety delivery. So we need to actually find a way of taking those examples of good practice and sharing them and, and making sure that they're acted on as well. So although these pieces of work are absolutely fundamental and critical to the work that the review is doing, they actually have much wider applicability across the agency. So it's a very strategic piece of work in the broader sense, not just in the sense of the strategic importance of the review. 
Obviously, as I've said, we have to assess our own role in this, and it really isn't possible to look at the whole system unless we look at how we function as a central competent authority. And all those things that we did that John showed you at the, the beginning to support, direct, guide, monitor local authorities are what we actually need to look at to see whether there are potential improvements that could be made to those systems. We're doing this piece of work internally within our own team um, in terms of um, developing what needs to be looked at and um, gathering the evidence for that. But obviously, again, to make sure it's done rigorously, to make sure it has credibility with our stakeholders, um, we need to um, have some kind of external oversight to that. So it's, although it's an internally conducted project, we will have uh, an external panel who are looking at what we're proposing to do and then analyse and looking at the evidence and analysis that we undertake. And that um, panel is going to be headed up by Sarah Wood, member of our EAG, and we're looking to get some other regulators onto that. The HSE have already agreed to join us and we're looking to get some um, um, some other relevant expertise like public health expertise and analytical expertise on it. Um, we're really looking at the system again in exactly the same way as we are looking at the system uh, in local authorities. I'm not looking at whether a particular person is competent to do their job. I'm looking at does the system actually allow us to achieve what we need to achieve. Do we actually have the powers that we need? I think that comes back to the point that Jeff made earlier to actually deliver on our responsibilities. How have we then put in place the structures and processes and resource to activate on those powers? And how effective is all this in allowing us to achieve our aims? This piece of work is really in its first stage at the moment. We're developing the external panel. We're working very hard to map out the system within the FSA that supports local and interacts with local authority delivery. Um, and we'll be looking then, um, we're just about to start the evidence gathering phase of it now. So we're expecting to complete this piece of work around about December time um, in terms of a final sign off we hope for um, from our independent panel. And then as I said, we've got some other projects that are really looking at um, helping us to generate ideas, understand good practice or other practice elsewhere and to scope out that landscape. Given the time, I don't propose to go through this at the moment, but if anybody has any questions, I'm very happy to um, field them. And then the final piece is this long-term horizon scanning piece of work, which you yourselves will actually be cited on in the not too distant future and be being asked for opinions and inputs and, and will be coming to you specifically with the outputs of this because this really is a big, broad, strategic piece of work for the organisation. It's focusing in on how do changes in the food system, full stop, and the, the world, the wider world, how might those impact on um, the delivery of official controls and how we make sure that we've got a sustainable system that allows us to control the risks um, and understand the long-term implications of change. But in actual fact, that's really going to inform the agency's wider um, sort of horizon scanning agenda and where we need to go as an organisation. So at the moment we've just completed phase of one of this which is where our partners in the, in the SURF team have worked with us to develop what we think are the key drivers for change and those being sense checked at the moment. From that they'll make some projections and again they'll come back to us and talk to us about that workshop with relevant people and then finally um, they'll develop some potential alternate scenarios about what might happen and test those and those will be being specifically presented to you um, as the board at some point. Uh, I'm not quite sure Kerry if you've got a, a time frame for that yet. Um, no, we're just working with Steve and his team about um, how best to play that out in terms of the strategy review that happens every year at the board retreat. We're, we've had our first meeting with Jeff about that. So I think it's, it's you know, this is a, a, a key piece of work for us because it's really important our understanding of the system um, and where what might happen and what risks we might need to take account of. But obviously it has much wider applicability across the organisation as well. So really, that's the structure of the evidence program. There's a lot of work going on in there. It's being done very rigorously according to all of the appropriate agency checks, balances and controls. The longest piece of it is definitely that piece of work looking at local authority delivery to get the information we need to do an assessment of a current system as well as do any option appraisal work. That's due to finish in about January 2013. So I think that's it for me on the evidence program. That's a very quick trot through it. But I'm happy, we've got 15 minutes left and I'd really like to get to, to allow Lou to tell you a little bit about our stakeholder engagement work. But does anybody have any questions on the evidence gathering at this point? 
No, nope, I've blinded you all with science. Okay, so Lou, I'm going to hand over to you now for our, okay. our last bit. Great. So um, I'm Louise, and probably a lot of people probably don't know me. Um, my background is actually very similar to Gail's. I'm a microbiologist, virologist, and I have a public health background as well. I've been at the agency for about since about 2006. Before then, I worked in the retail sector, um, involved in a lot of scientific work. But actually, through that, I've done a huge amount of engagement, building up very good uh, engagement and links with obviously the scientific community, both in the UK and internationally and working very closely with other government departments and industry on initiatives to uh, reduce salmonella and campylobacter on farm, um, as well as having to deliver some really complex scientific information to stakeholders in a way that they can understand and sometimes getting some buy-in from very difficult, around difficult messages. Um, I can note particularly the um, campylobacter survey of retail chicken having to sit down with the poultry industry and explain to them that actually we hadn't moved an awful lot in five years. So that was quite a difficult conversation, but I was able to get that bind. So that's where the engagement side comes into what I, what I had done previously. Engagement for the review. Well, engagement is an integral part of the review, as I'm sure, sure you'll appreciate. We've already stated our commitment to ensure there is, we maintain active, ongoing and two-way engagement with stakeholders throughout the process. And we're aiming to deliver an engagement plan that both supports and underpins the work for the rest of the programme and will actually help inform the direction of the review. It's also going to be there about providing reassurance to our stakeholders about the work we're undertaking, which is really essential if we're to ensure the credibility of the review and obviously by proxy the credibility of the agency itself. Engagement is also key for, to get the, the buy-in from, the, um, from the necessary, which is necessary from our stakeholders to help get them to input into the review to help us do the decision um, with our decision making. And also to make sure we get ourselves positioned correctly that we get the crucial support we need from the key decision makers if we are to have any success, able to successfully implement any of the recommendations um, we make. As you would expect, this is a large and complex piece of work and we have an equally large and complex stakeholder base. This means we're having to think very carefully about different engagement strategies for dealing with each of these to make sure we can communicate most effectively. I'm going to quickly try and run through each of these kind of roughly what the stakeholder base is externally to give you some of the kind of flavour of this. This kind of first slide covers the kind of two key stakeholder groups who are really on the receiving end of official controls. We're all very familiar with consumers, um, and this is the group who the controls are really there in, in place to protect. And obviously, for the FSA, consumer protection is our primary, our primary aim, so it's important that we're engaging with them about the review. Obviously, this is a very diverse group, but as you, uh, we can generally conclude about consumers that what they want is the reassurance that the controls are in place and the food they purchase in the UK is safe to eat. They also want to have some transparency in the system. They want to know where the lines of accountability and responsibility are. Our engagement with consumers, therefore, will primi primarily aim to, un to test our understanding of what they think the system is about, but also to test the acceptability of any recommendations we may make. The agency, I'm sure you heard at the last board meeting, already has a number of existing engagement routes, uh, engagement routes for talking to consumers, and we'll be looking to make full use of these as part of the review process. And indeed, we're already in, the, um, already in the position of starting to develop a series of citizens' forums that we're going to run later on in the year. The second box um, covers industry, and that will include food businesses operating at any stage of the food chain who are subject to the controls that we're talking about. You could almost call them the customers of official controls. The priorities for industry may vary slightly from consumers, but like consumers, this is a very diverse group and can literally come from the, the single man operating out of his, uh, his kitchen with a very small micro-catering business right through to the large multinational organisations. So what I try to do is actually split this into two key groups, the large organisations and the small, medium and micro-businesses. We already have some good links within the agency for talking to the large organisations through our, stakeholder for, uh, for our industry stakeholder forum and indeed we even have representatives on our consultative group. But the interaction with this second group of small, medium and micro-businesses is a lot more challenging. So what we're trying to do is plan a range of initiatives specifically aimed at catching information from this group. This feedback will help provide us with the intelligence that we need to conduct the review to understand the changing landscape in the industry to ensure that official controls deliveries align to the needs and risks of that industry both now and in the future. 
It's also about testing potential recommendations to see how this might actually, how these might actually work for those people who are actually on the receiving end of official controls. The next slide covers very much the, the, the local authority groups, those sitting within local authorities. Local authority delivery, um, we talked about quite a lot today, it includes all the professionals who are actually doing this work day to day in the 400 plus local authorities in the UK. Again, I've, I've grouped them together here, but again, this is a hugely diverse group of people. We, different professionals, um, environmental health, trading standards, port health, all have different views. Views will also vary depending on which authority they actually work in. Are they in England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland? They'll be different. What type of authority are they working in? That will vary. And actually, as I've touched on previously, the views actually even vary within the same authorities themselves. You'll find that what people at the top of the office and the, the heads of service and managers think will be very different from those people who are actually delivering official controls on the ground. That's a big surprise. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, so what's going to have to happen is we need to try and capture this diversity from across this whole band. Obviously, this is the group actually responsible for delivering official controls. Therefore, at the moment, most of our, um, most of our engagement has been very much focused on talking to these people. Yes, in fact, talk to people. What we're doing is we're basically trying to give them the reassurance. We were aware about the personal impact that obviously the announcement of the review had on people. Um, we're talking about people's jobs, essentially. So it's understandable there are concerns. And also, we say, talk about change, uncertainty. There's a lot of that around the moment. People are concerned. And so we've been working very much to build trust in the review to give them the reassurance that we're, what we're undertaking. And that's also twofold, giving them the reassurance, but also about encouraging them to get involved in the review. And as, I, as I've already mentioned, 12 months of very, very hard work has managed to almost completely, you know, 180 turn views around to the point that people are now actually volunteering to be, be part of this. The second group is the local authority elected members who are the community leaders um, in the various local authorities across the country. And these are the people who really make the decisions about where resources are, are placed for service delivery at the local level. Um, and as we know, the priority they give to food safety will vary across, across the piece. As you say, we saw from John's presentation earlier, we're, you know, LGA are predicting that the gap between authorities, local authorities' income and expenditure will continue to widen over the coming years. And so they're going to have to make some really tough choices about um, where cuts can be made. And we need to understand this to ensure that we're taking active steps to, and making sure we have the influence to keep food safety on the agenda um, and also to make them aware of the outcomes of the review itself. This is pretty much the last slide for me, so this is quite quick, and I'd say we're getting quite close to time. So, the last slide for me is covers the stakeholders at the kind of, I suppose, the central government level. Um, we're already engaging um, very closely with policy leads at a number of key government departments, including DEFRA, DCLG, BDRO, and the governments for each of the devolved um, administrations. Obviously, the priorities will vary depending upon what policy for which they're responsible. Engagement here is very much focused on building strong links with these, with these departments, raising awareness about the review, understanding the, the wider changes that are going on, what's going to be influencing local authorities, and also about gaining their support early on. We need that support to then start to build the foundation for what we need to eventually do, which is actually going and talking to getting that engagement at the ministerial level. We need this support if we want to actually implement any of the recommendations what we consider to be in the best interests of consumers. So, as I said, it's not just about going in and talking to the ministers, but actually speaking to the senior policy teams and their advisors to get that support early on before we can have these really useful discussions at that level. So, Gail mentioned earlier that obviously we can do something that we consider to be a very small change. We still need to have that support. Things will have to go through a gateway review. We'll have to build up a full business case with appropriate evidence to, to back that up. And I'm not going to go over, go over that ground again. So, very briefly for me, but I say I, I realise we're coming close to time. Just to really summarise, effective engagement is going to be an intrinsic part of the review. We need that to get the input we need from stakeholders to actually inform the process itself. But it's also about making sure that we get the support we need to successfully implement any of the recommendations we make. We don't have the power necessary to do that ourselves. We have to get support from elsewhere. So the number of stakeholders is large and it's diverse. 
So we need to be thinking about different ways that we can, we can engage them. That's going to be challenging. And it will take time to really lay that groundwork and that foundation to really have those really pr um, productive um, conversations. It's not just about delivering positive messages, but actually by demonstrating the rigour we're applying to the process, the fact we have no predetermined outcomes, the fact we're looking at these wider implications of change, not just for the food safety, but looking at various schemes, I'm saying, talking to BDRO about the primary authority schemes they're doing, understanding the challenges around um, you know, reducing regulation, um, economic support, etc. Understanding how this works, works, um, works in, in the broadest, broadest sense. We're planning a range of ways in which to actually conduct the um, engagement. And I've noticed that I've told you I haven't really told you an awful lot what we're actually planning, because uh, I would probably be here for another three hours telling you about the range of initiatives that we're actually thinking about. But just to be assured that it will be running throughout the life of the review. But also, it will be important that the engagement will have to continue beyond any recommendation point to, to actually support any potential implementation stage at the end. And that's it for me, but I'm happy to answer it again. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any particular questions about our engagement with any particular stakeholder group, either now or afterwards. If you don't have any questions for Louise, and I, I would stress that, you know, from my perspective as an evidence program manager, the work that Louise and, and her little team do is absolutely crucial for me because I can't get the evidence I need if the local authorities, for example, for example, don't play ball with us. So this really is absolutely critical, which is why we wanted to reassure you all that, that we're taking it very seriously and that the work is happening. So at this point, I'd just really like quickly to sum up, and you've got a few minutes to, to ask us any more questions, although we have already had a very full and frank discussion this morning. Um, we think that there's a strong rationale for undertaking a very evidence-based review of the delivery of official controls now. That we've developed a robust and evidence-based program to undertake the review that has absolutely no predetermined outcomes in our team's mind. Whatever views anybody else in the organisation holds are their business, but our views are that this could be anything from a leave it alone to a radically change it and anything in the middle at the end of this process. The assessment and appraisal has already begun and Kerry and John are working really hard on developing the process for that at the moment and feeding in the evidence that we actually had. But it will be building in rigour over 2012 and into 2013 as that evidence base that I'm responsible for delivering to them actually starts to come in and they can use it. And it's supported by a really comprehensive stakeholder engagement work stream to essentially undo the damage that happened at the beginning of this and provide the reassurance to local authorities out there that you know we are doing this the right way for the right reasons and to make sure that we have the, the, the biggest and strongest chance of successfully implementing whatever the board decides is the way forward. And I think that's it. But I guess the last thing to just quickly tell you is that obviously we're due to come to you with formal progress reports um, in the next one is due in September. Um, so just a couple of months away um, and then in March 2013 and we've already discussed that you would actually probably really like to talk about the evidence at that one um, which I'd be as I say very very happy to come and do. The critical decision point for this phase of the work where we're doing the review looking at, at potential alternate delivery options and coming to you with a recommendation will be July 2013 and in the meantime if there are significant things that are happening um, we'll pop out either a Friday update to you um, through the Friday mail out system or if it's a more substantial issue we can pop together an intersessional paper for you. But I think what I'd really like to encourage, um, because this is such a huge and important piece of work for the organisation and because we want you to feel as informed and involved as you feel you need to be, is all of our contact details are in that pack. Use them. Pick up the phone. Organise to come and see us. If there are particular aspects of the work that you want to talk about in more detail that you want to find out more about, we're very, very happy to have those conversations. Um, that's why we put our contact details in there because we recognise that even with a three-hour session with you this morning, there's a hell of a lot going on in our programme of work and we've really only touched the surface of it. So I think I'd like to say thank you. Thank you to the theme team. Thank you all for listening. And at that point, I'm going to stop talking, which is a, a completely astonishing feat for me, um, and ask if there are anything else that you'd like to ask us. I'll take that as a no. Um, <laughs> take that as a, uh...
I know. I mean, Gail, I really do appreciate, and I think on behalf of everybody, the effort that the team's put into organising the uh, presentation. And I'll just make, I'll make two points. I'm not going to try and sum up, but it relates to something Clive said and something Andrew said. I hope you'll both go away from this meeting more reassured than you were at the beginning of it, but basically thoroughly understanding the scepticism, the doubt, the uncertainty, and the uncomfortable position the board members felt themselves in in March. And I don't think that is the situation now. Uh, I hope we've made considerable progress. So we have a lot more information. And in some ways, um, it may be we contact you, but there's an awful big gap between September and March. And if there is anything, I think what I would say is if anything in terms of the timetable that changes, we'd like to be informed about it, I mean, basically. I think the adding of the year on without any warning whatsoever really hit us hard. You know, that was gobsmacking in a way. And that probably caused an overreact. Well, you get an overcompensation, don't you? But I really do appreciate the effort that's gone into this. Um, because uh, uh, I, I want to defend it because I think it's what we're doing. I mean, it's very important to do, uh, to do it. And we've identified, and in some ways, by the way, what happens on animal feed may actually alter the course of how you work, you know, because obviously we'll have a look at animal feed as a board later in the year. And we've got to be careful we don't send the wrong signals out of anything we do on animal feed that impinges on all the work you've done in rebuilding the trust between the professionals that we haven't got a predetermined outcome. And, I, and I'm not predetermining animal feed, but one way or another, there's got to be, obviously, there's going to be a change in that some way. But that is important that that doesn't derail or send in the back But really, on behalf of the board, I do appreciate it, and thank you very much for the effort that you put into this. Thanks very much. Well, I hope you feel very reassured now that we are doing this the right way, that we're going to be delivering you something that you feel that you'll be able to take the decisions that you need to take upon um, at the time when we can actually do that for you. And we certainly take on board the point about making sure that you're kept up to date with any changes in the program. Um, just before we um, ring off, I'd just like to ask Clive and, and Sarah, who have um, sat there through the whole meeting and made very good contributions when needed, if they wanted to add anything else. No, best wishes with the work. No, nothing for me. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much for um, popping into the office for us, Clive and Sarah, and, and attending. And um, are they going to be joined by someone to replace Liz? They will be. We're looking at that at the moment, and um, I've had some discussions with both Tim and Alison about who would be appropriate. Obviously, we have sort of industry, local government, and we had consumer, and I think it's quite important to keep that balance in, in the EAG. So we're looking at who would be appropriate at the moment, and we'll be coming to you with some recommendations about I'm that. trying to find somebody a bit more robust. Those two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we really like to be challenged. <laughs> Gail, could I suggest that um, if the opportunity is appropriate, that board members would know when the stakeholder engagement is taking place, the stakeholder meeting group that I was at before, um, as observers, board members could attend that. Yeah, and I think that absolutely. Yeah. By these dates, I think it would be really valuable if it, if it fits with people's diaries. Okay. I mean, we can certainly make a, a, we have a diary of key dates that we can make available to the board secretariat, for example, um, so that if people um, would like to come along. There are some specific uh, areas where you would be being asked to be involved specifically anyway, because we'll need some of your views. For example, some of the surf work on the horizon scanning. Um, we're going to want some important things. So um, there was already plans to engage with that. But if, if people are particularly interested, then if you're interested in that, we can make the, the diary of dates available. But my my suggestion would be, if you have particular interest in attending any of the, the workshops, talk to Louise, who coordinates all that work, and again, contact details in the pack. Yeah, can I just also say, Clive Sarah, by the way, I mean, uh, uh, said to Sarah before you arrived, Clive, that really appreciate you making yourself available to come in this morning. But also, um, if at any time you think you want to talk to us as the board, particularly you, you actually reach the point when you put your fist on the table and almost walked away because of, you saw this issue about resources and effort. If that point arrives again for any reason, I think the board should be, you know, welcome to hear from you. Okay, I hope it doesn't. You. Well, do thank you. <laughs> you don't obviously did. Great. That's it. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You very much.
And now we have to get out of the other team flank so they can reorganize. Well, we weren't going to have this. It was, it was 